word to prosperity, financial boom. Come back to you and say that you have to pay. That's very disrespectful. Right, right. I'm telling you, I am super, super excited. And next time, Pastor Dan has something like this. If you have that, people get it. Yeah. It's Eminem. I'm here to learn about financial management and investment. We good. Because we're getting ready to help some people build generational wealth and become financially free. That's what the day is all about. We want to empower people to live a better life. The cycle of poverty is about to be broken. The, the, the spirit of not enough is about to be broken. The spirit of insufficiency will no longer be part of your DNA. You will no longer live from paycheck to Monday because today you're getting ready to Hit prosper. The Introducing to some Hit the uh, that don't know him. And those of us that do know him, welcoming Dan Johnson. Hey. Let me get that mic. I need that. Come on, how y'all doing? Y'all all right? Come on, y'all all right? Come, I need y'all to do me a favor. I'm gonna say how y'all doing, y'all gonna say I'm empowered. Is that all right? How y'all doing? Um, a power to prosperity has helped me with in terms of budgeting my money correctly in the right way. What I like most is that it really shined a light on my financial situation. Um, I learned a lot about my finances in such a short amount of time. Um, I really am now under the understand of the true education of why we need to be educated on financial literacy and how important it is that we exercise this within our everyday life. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Now let me tell you what you're saying. When you say you're empowered, what you're saying is that you have the capacity. You, you can hit it. You can turn it off. What you're saying that you have the capacity and the competency to become whatever it is that God created you to become. Whenever someone says to me, how you doing? Everybody, most people that know me, I've been saying it for 20 years, I'm empowered. And what I'm really saying is I have the capacity and the competency to become everything that God has created me to be. Is that all right? Amen. And so I want to take this moment to thank all of you uh, brave soldiers for um, signing up, registering to tolerate uh, myself and the team for the next um, several hours um, as, we, as we journey on this journey of what we call empowered to prosperity. Empowered to prosperity. Um, I tell you about this agenda. We got an agenda, y'all, and we're not going to make it through the agenda. <laughs> I figured it out. We're not going to make it through the agenda. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do, this is a boot camp, but my, my, my spiritual mother, she does what's called intensives. But our agenda, our agenda, let's, let's go over our agenda. The Bible says, in all thy getting, get a what? and understanding all that getting of wisdom we got to get an understanding right and so we're going to open up with getting an understanding of some things um, we're going to talk about financial prioritization we're going to talk about elimination we're going to talk about debt uh, elimination credit building we're going to talk about asset protection wealth generation and we probably won't get to the taxes taxes and taxes now throughout you're going to hear me um, Throughout this boot camp, you're going to hear about your financial goals. It's going, to, it's going to always mention what are your financial goals. It's going to also always mention you got to establish a budget. No matter where we are, you're going to hear that. Some, is going, some may call it your spending plan, right? Um, whatever you want to call it, I call it financial prioritization. In every area, we're going to have, to, you're going to hear me say it, you're going to see it in a book, it's going to seem like it's repetitive, you want to know why? Because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Okay. Yeah, that's good. My God. I'm going to say it one more time. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where you are going, guess what's going to happen? Any road will take you there. So your, your budget, your financial prioritization 
It literally becomes your roadmap to what we call wealth and financial freedom. I am, I am, I got a few people, a couple of people that's with me that we're going to um, hear from, and I'm not going to steal their thunder um, by introducing them now, but I'm super, super, super excited about the team that's going to be pouring into you today. And I just ask that you have an open mindset. I want you to have an open mind. Why do I want you to have an open mind? Because the reality is, I was driving this morning, and I heard this thing, I heard, I, I, we all know it, that there is a thing called generational wealth. Y'all yep. agree to that, right? Yes. And generational wealth is wealth that's transferred from one generation to the next generation. But there's another thing called generational poverty. Yep. And that is poverty that's being transferred from one generation to the next generation. Yes, sir. And the difference between generational wealth and generational poverty is your mindset. It's how you think. Yes, sir. It's how you process. Yes, sir. Is do you look at tragedy as a time of despair or a time of opportunity? Please, sir. Right? Tragedy produces opportunity. Mm. <laughs> when COVID hit, as many businesses went out of business, there was more millionaires that, got, that became millionaires because of tragedy. People were forced off the jobs that they did not like, forced to pursue their purpose and their passion and all of those type of things. And now they're in business for themselves and they did not go back. Why? It was a result of tragedy. Right. Are y'all hearing me? Go ahead. And so we want to make certain that we properly um, position ourselves to take opportunity. And I'm going to tell you, um, this is, I, I want to thank you once again because this is an inaugural, this is our pilot, if you will. Uh, this Empowered to Prosperity boot camp. It's, it comes from this idea that I've been teaching for years of four fundamental principles of building wealth and financial freedom. And so it's in those four principles is prioritization. Everybody say prioritization. prioritization. Elimination. Elimination. Protection, protection. And generation. generation. Now, Reva, y'all give it up for Reva. Y'all give it up for Reva. Reva's the one that led us into worship. Yeah, I'm, we've been hanging together for like decades, right? Um, so that means I was very young. <laughs> I won't try to say nothing. But here's the reality. The reality is this. Out of everything that she read about that bio, license insurance producer, Licensed real estate broker, 2022, first half of 2022, top real estate uh, agent of the, of the year, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's the truth. I, I grew up in Inglewood. I grew up in Inglewood. Um, two drug addicted parents. Homelessness. Um, mice were pets. Wow. We had names for them. And roaches wasn't roaches, they were just insects. Y'all understand that? That's where I came from. Nobody left me nothing. Nobody gave me nothing. Just God. God gave me wisdom. And, and he gave me a hunger to break the mold. My grandmother would say that as a young man, I would tell her that one day I would be rich. Mm -hmm. One day, she would, whenever she called and needed something, I'd be there to buy it. She said, that's what I said as a little kid. And so I'm grateful that we have experienced that one day. Okay. And my passion, because God is not a respect of person, he's a respecter of faith. Mm -hmm. Are y'all hearing me? He's a, he's a, watch this, not only is he a respecter of faith, but what I learned, he's a respecter of work. Because faith without works is dead. Are y'all understanding? And so, um, what, what we are endeavoring to do is do the work, help you tap into faith, 
And what I learned about our faith increases when we're confident. Why? Because when you're confident, you kind of go after it. And, and preparation helps confidence. Is, does this make sense? Yes. Preparation helps build confidence. Our people are destroyed not because of the devil. The Bible says because of the lack of knowledge. And so that's what we're here to do over, the, over these next several hours. Let's get right into it. Let's get into a financial understanding. Let's get into a financial understanding. Now I'll be, everything I'm talking about is in your book and there's a bunch of stuff I'm going to talk about that's not in the manual. <laughs> just, just so you know, so let's take some notes. But I want to get into a financial understanding. First of all, we need to understand that there are biblical principles as it pertains to financial literacy. The Bible actually has over 2,000 verses of scripture that deals with managing possessions, deals with how you handle money. How are you handling money? And, and so it's so important that we understand that we have to become stewards. Everybody say stewards. 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 Steward says that you, stewardship is not ownership. Say stewardship, stewardship. is not ownership. It's not ownership. What stewardship is, is managing. You manage what you have. And if you manage what you have well, guess what's going to happen? If you manage what you have well, you are going to be successful. So, in understanding, we got to have a biblical principles of financial literacy. Why financial literacy is important. We're going to examine today's financial challenges. We're going to look at wealth. We're going to look at net worth. Now, let's deal with financial literacy. Financial literacy is important for several reasons. Number one, personal financial management, right? Number two, career success. Number three, personal empowerment. Number four, financial stability. And number five, economic growth. One of the things that we have not been taught, we were taught in school reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? We were taught in school um, history, right, wrong, and different. <laughs> but we never was taught the money game. We were never taught how to handle money. And so you can become very, very successful, Ms. T.D., you can become very, very successful, but if you don't know how to handle money, if you don't know the money game, you will ultimately be broke. How do I know? Look at all of the entertainers. Look at all of the athletes. Millions upon millions upon millions, say again, millions of dollars. And the truth is many of them are broke because they didn't understand how money works. So I need y'all to do me a favor. I need you to put your hands together and give yourselves a hand for making a decision to come and learn how money works. Now my job today is not just to provide education. My job today is to provide edu-action. The difference between education and edu-action is where you put the C. If you put the C in front of the A, it's education. If you put the C after the A, it's edu-action. <laughs> Are y'all seeing this? Yeah. Why do I want you to have education instead of education? Because education, sometimes we get, we get into information overload. Yeah. And we don't apply it. Part of us as believers, part of our challenge, many of us as believers, is that we are great hearers, but we're poor doers. Go ahead. Are y'all seeing this? Go ahead. So, so we want to have edu, somebody say edu. edu. Action. action. At the end of this, we want you to take action on what you've been educated with. All right. So, let's, let's look at today's challenges. The financial climate uh, of low and middle class Americans is complex, it's very challenging. 
Many low and middle income households struggle to make ends meet. Um, I always say they, they're, they're a good friend of mine, um, I, I had the pleasure of publishing her book. And um, she is now going on to do financial literacy, coaching and all that stuff for Russell Simmons, all of that. But um, old Dan Johnson, by the grace of God, published her first book called Paycheck to Monday. By the name of Lynn Richardson. I helped her put that book together, walked her through some stuff, Paycheck to Monday. And unfortunately, that's how many people live their lives. Part of the challenge today is we live from paycheck to Monday. It used to be paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> Lynn Richardson. Used to be paycheck to paycheck. Now it's paycheck to Monday. Get paid on Friday, Monday you going to pay, pay they loan places. Are y'all understanding this? And so we gotta break that, we gotta break that. So let's, so, so that's a challenge. How many of you agree that's a challenge? And can I tell you something about the middle class? The challenge is the middle class carries the bulk of the weight of our economics. And what's dangerous about that is that that middle class can't carry the weight so it begins to shrink. A lot from uh, today's event, um, mainly about the financial budgeting for our future, understanding the raise that we got today, honestly, that I'm going to use to help benefit my credit in the future and uh, really start financial planning for my future, my wife's future, and my eventual family. Yeah, I just want to say I just love the authenticity of the, the workshop. I think it um, really brought like real life uh, financial issues that families and individuals go through. So I really appreciate the candidacy and you changed our lives and we're going to work from there. The middle class pays more in taxes. The middle, y'all understand this, right? Because the poverty, the low, the low income, they don't really have, they don't pay nothing. The rich, they don't pay nothing. Because the rich know some stuff. For example, you can make a million dollars. Million dollars in revenue. Can I show you real quick? Now, let me throw out some disclaimers. I am not an accountant. Not a CPA, I'm not a lawyer. You'll see in the book, it's gonna tell you to consult with. But I've had the same accountant the same CPA since I was 19 years old. He was my accountant teacher at Chicago State University and now he's the dean of the accounting department. So I've learned a few things. <laughs> Here's the deal. One million dollars in revenue. How do I avoid paying taxes off of one million dollars in revenue? If I have enough land, I go get me a cow or go get me some agriculture. Because you get almost 99% tax break. Teach, sir. Teach. <laughs> See, what you don't know can hurt you. Thank you. Are <laughs> y'all understanding? And so we'll, we'll learn some of those things. Now, as, as we move on, there's, there's, here's the top 10 financial challenges that we've identified today. Number one is debt. Number one is debt. That's a challenge. Number two, lack of emergency savings. That's a challenge. Number three, retirement savings. That's a challenge. How many people you know that's retiring? They retire off of working a job for 40 years to go get another job. And let me tell you something else about the money game. The reality is they're moving the retirement age further back because people are living longer. And what they're really trying to do is see how they can catch up with Social Security, which perhaps may not be there by the time you get there. Are y'all seeing this? So they keep moving it back, forcing you to work longer or penalize you for stop working to go out. Are y'all getting this? So, so I believe the only social security I'm going to have is, the is what I secure for myself within the society by which I live. That's my social security. I opened it up and said like $800. I said, what? 
hundred. If I retire today, they're gonna pay me eight hundred dollars. Eight hundred. Think of eight hundred dollars. No, no. So you gotta understand that healthcare costs, income inequality, housing costs, job insecurity, financial illiteracy is a challenge. Rising cost of education. Lack of access to banking services. Not just having a bank account, but banking services. But let's move on. Let's, let's deal with understanding wealth. Because wealth refers to an abundance of valuable possessions, assets, resources that are owned or controlled by an individual or family organization. It can include physical assets such as real estate, investments, cash, as well as intangible assets such as knowledge. Here is the question though. I was, I was preaching somewhere um, and I said, I said everybody wants to be wealthy. Yep. And y'all heard how Miss Shirley said, yep. yep. I actually had one say, nope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the middle of my sermon, I was preaching about, I don't know, I'm always preaching about empowerment something. And, and, and I said, how many of you in the room would not desire to be wealthy? She said, <laughs> I'm going to tell y'all what I thought, because <laughs> she's not here. <laughs> the lies you tell. <laughs> because nobody want to struggle financially, am I right? Nobody want to spend every day trying to figure out how they're going to live for the next day. Right? And so, but here's what I learned by that. I learned that everyone's definition of wealth it's different. I learned that, Miss Sheila. Y'all do me a favor. Miss Sheila, the Lord then blessed her to live another year. Y'all say Merry Birthday to Miss Sheila. Oh, Merry Birthday, Merry Birthday. Had I realized that I would have had a cake, they would have been coming out with the cake. Merry Birthday. <laughs> but, but seriously, um, so I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about what does wealth mean to you? And I want you to write it in your book. Take, take about two minutes real quick. What does wealth mean to you? For some people, wealth means to own their own home. Some people, wealth means to be able to pay their kids' college education. What does wealth mean to you? What's your personal definition of wealth? What does wealth mean to you? Now there's a formula to help you calculate wealth. And, and, and many times um, you may hear, how many of you ever Googled somebody, how many of you ever Googled net worth? And you was wondering how much somebody was making it like for real, for real, and you Google net worth. And so um, there's a formula and we're gonna share that with you right now um, of what and how to calculate your, what your wealth looks like. And it's understanding net worth. Understanding net worth is assets, everybody say assets. assets. Minus, liabilities Minus liabilities equals, equals net, worth. net worth. So here, here it is. If you take everything that you have, convert it to cash, that's your asset, right? Pay off everything that you owe. That's a basic understanding, that's a basic premise. And I got a financial expert in the room, so if I miss a step, stub my toe, um, he'll whisper it to me, he's not gonna tell y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that's what your net worth is. It's assets minus liabilities equals net worth, right? So let's look at some assets. We got real estate, we got vehicles, we got investments, we got retirement accounts, we got business interests, we got personal properties, we got cash and cash equivalents. That's considered an asset. Then I like to look at it this way. An asset is anything that's putting money in your pocket. Yes, sir. A liability is anything that's taking money out of your pocket. When I was about 20, I was, I was in Paris and I met this gentleman and he and I began to talk. 
And he said something to me. He said, you know, you sound like, um, I read this book recently. He started snapping his finger. He said, have you ever heard of Bob Kiyosaki? I said, no, never heard of him. He said, but some of the things that you talk about as far as principles is in this book. I said, what's the book? He said, rich dad, poor dad. And he said, I got it right here. And he gave me a copy. He gave me his rich dad, poor dad book. And one of the things, a principle that I took from that book is that anything that was going to cost me more than $500 to consume, mm. I would take the $500 and invest it and then buy it with the return on my investment. Okay. Okay. Are y'all seeing that? Yes. So I put the money that I wanted to consume because we are great consumers. In some of our communities, we consume more than some countries' GDP. We, we, we're consuming about $400 billion a year as consumers. Right? And so that's what, we would, that's what we would do. So a liability is anything that takes money out of your pocket. Right? Like mortgages, credit card debt, auto loans, student loans, personal loans. It looked like we have a conflict of interest. Because on one side, you saw the conflict. How many of y'all see the conflict of interest on those two slides? Oh, because on one side it says real estate is an asset, right? But then it said mortgage is a liability, right? On another one it says that a vehicle is an asset, right? And on the other one it says an auto loan is a, a liability, correct? So here's how this breaks down. If I own a home, and let's say my home is, is valued at $350,000, but I owe $200,000. The $150,000 is an asset. That's my equity. That's mine. The $200,000, which is part of the mortgage, becomes a liability. Because the asset brings money in, the liability takes it away. <laughs> so, and I'm trying to keep it really simple so you guys can understand it. I don't have a car note. Every car, by the grace of God, that, by the grace of God that me, my wife, my, that we all drive, every car does not have a auto loan on it. So that means those cars are considered an asset. I can convert them to cash. Are y'all seeing this? So that's the difference between a liability and an asset. And so that's why we want to help you to protect your assets. We want to help you to protect what you have. Amen. Now, let's look at financial freedom. Financial freedom refers to a state of being where an individual has sufficient and financial resources and security to make choices about how they live their life. It means that an individual has enough money saved, invested, or earned to support themselves and their family and to enjoy their life without worrying about money. So, five indicators that you are financially free. Repeat after me, say debt free. Debt free. Living within your means. Within your means. I think we should say that again. Living within your means. Passive income, emergency fund, this is how you really know you're free. Pursuing your passion, and I'd like to say pursuing your purpose. And most times, purpose and passion are right there together. If I ask the question, how many of you right now work a job? How many of you right now feel the job you work in is part is your purpose? That's good. Now, how many are getting paid enough on that job in pursuing your purpose? Nobody? Can I get one? My oh, man, I got one over there. He said, that's me. I'm good. I just came for the t-shirt. <laughs> Five indicators you're financially free. But here's what I learned. Just like wealth, your vision of wealth is different. 
your idea of being financially free is also different, right? So my definition, um, well, before I tell you mine, I want to know, uh, what is your definition of financial freedom? It's, it's in, your, in, in your book. I want you to write it down. And notice I've skipped past the net worth uh, worksheet, but I do want you to go home, fill that out. It gives you all of the indicators that you should have um, to help you determine what your net worth is. And you want to see that number grow. I don't want to spend the rest of my life and my net worth never changes, right? But what is your definition of financial freedom? What is your definition? I tell you mine. My definition of financial freedom is living the kind of life I desire to live without the consideration of cost. It's real simple. Living the kind of life that I desire to live without the consideration of cost. Period. One of my favorite places to travel is Dubai. I've committed to just about to try to go to Dubai every year. I don't want to have to consider how much it's going to cost for me to get there. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? That's, so, so I'm still not financially free. It's hard because you've got five children and stuff. <laughs> we do all right, though. I'm, I'm raising them to, you know, to pursue their own passion and Y'all understand what I'm saying? So they could become financially free. It'll free me up financially, I'm telling you. But living the kind of life you desire to live without the consideration of cost. What is your definition? Anybody want to share real quick their definition of financial freedom? Same as yours. Nope, you got to pick your own. No, I'm just like. <laughs> my money to purchase whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I am, and what I want. I heard that. Period. <laughs> Who else? Who else want to share? Definition of financial. Yes, Reef. Well, it's, it is kind of part of what you said, but uh, my main part was to owe any, to not know, owe anyone anything. Go ahead. Well, you're gonna owe somebody something, especially me. You gotta owe me some love. <laughs> That's all. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> What's yours, Ms. Meach? It says living a life of financial abundance without debt. Yeah, financial abundance without debt. That means I'm not paying nobody nothing. What's yours? You want to tell me? Uh, yeah, I said uh, being debt free but rich in assets, which is kind of more like wealth. Uh, but they also, also said the ability to move and be without fear, uh, timidity, and consideration. Wow, that's powerful. To move without fear, timidity, and you said consideration. consideration. I don't even have to consider it. So that's my so my definition is living the kind of life I desire to live without the consideration of cost. But now, when as I was coming up, I told God and my grandmother that I want to build a million dollar seed empire. The key word is seed. I know I've gotten to where I need to be if I'm able to just get, if seed a million dollars on an annual basis without blinking. But here's what I want to help you guys understand. I'm not going to wait till I get the million to start seeding. Are y'all understanding? Because sometimes we wait till all of the ducks line up in a row before we pull the trigger. And y'all got to understand that ducks don't sit still. So if you wait for them to line up, you'll never pull the trigger. I'm just saying, I ain't never seen 10 ducks just get in a line. But, but here, 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 here it is. When I was 20, having this vision, we started adopting families for Thanksgiving. Maybe 5, 10, 15. Then we started adopting kids for the homeless population in Inglewood. 10 children, 15 children. Well, last year, through the efforts of our non-for-profit, our church partner, our fraternity, we serviced over 3,500 people for Thanksgiving. And we've now serviced as much on one Christmas, 800 kids whose mother is incarcerated, 
whose parents are either incarcerated, deceased, or on drugs. We call it Grandma's Help for Christmas. But we started 20 some years ago just with what we got. What am I saying to you? Work with what you have and watch it work. All right, we gotta go, we gotta go. So, let's, go, let's j- jump into financial prioritization. And I pray y'all don't mind, we started about 15 minutes, we wanted to make certain Jonathan had his technical stuff together so we could roll. So we are gonna probably be a little bit, about 15 minutes behind. Financial prioritization is a process of determining which financial goals or obligations are most, somebody say most, most important, important, and allocating resources accordingly, right? And so we got strategies. We got strategies for effective financial prioritization. Number one, setting clear financial goals and breaking them down into manageable steps. Mm-hmm. I, I, where, what are your goals? And break them down because if you can reach one at this level, once you reach one, that carries the momentum to get to the other. Right? We, we don't want to say, my goal is I want $10 million. That's a good goal. I coach entrepreneurs. And I believe I can scale any business to seven figures. Because scaling a business to seven figures is a financial formula. <laughs> It's numbers. So we break down. I was coaching um, someone um, out of Detroit, and they said, I want to have a million dollars in revenue. I said, okay. I got an understanding of what their business plan was, what their, um, what their business model was, how they made money, and all of that. And we broke it down. And I said, okay, based on this, you're going to have to touch 967 people. Uh, and out of that 967 people with a 20% closing ratio, you got to... And we begin to break that down. She said, I think I need to adjust my goal. <laughs> Good. Now let's adjust the goal to something manageable that you can do. And when we hit that, now let's readjust. Are y'all seeing this? So you want to you wanna allocate resources. Um, you you want to set clear financial goals, right? You want to rank them according to priority based on urgency, importance, and potential impact over your overall health. You want to allocate resources um, based on our, how they're needed at the, at the, over a period of time, and you want to regularly review the progress and adjust accordingly. All right? Now, when you're dealing with financial prioritization, there's two principles that you have to deal with. You have to deal with income, somebody say income, and expenses. Right, you gotta, that's what you deal with. So you gotta first, if you're going to have a budget, it, it really wears me out when I'm doing co- consulting and they come and I say, you got a budget, yes. And the budget is a bunch of expensing, expenses. That's a spending plan. But how do you plan on getting the money to spend? So a budget, financial prioritization must track two things. It must track income, how much money is coming in and it must, attra- it must track expenses, how much money is going out. That's the only way that you'll be able to establish a realistic budget. Now, here, here it is, important steps in managing income and expenses. Number one, we want to track them. Number two, I told y'all, y'all gonna hear me say this all the time, create a budget. Number three, we want to set financial goals. Number four, we want to reduce expenses. Number five, we want to increase income. Now, I am the guy. There's two ways to balance a budget. Because some of you may say, well, you know what? I don't budget because I don't make enough money anyway. If you don't know where you're going, any road's going to take you there, right? But there's two ways to balance a budget. How many ways? Two. Two. How many ways? Two. Two. It's, It's either A, Increase income or B, decrease expenses. I want to teach you how to decrease expenses first. Because if I don't teach you how to decrease expenses first, then you'll continue to make a lot of money, but you'll spend it all out. It'll run out the door. 
right? Because our mindset is consumerism. We give our money to Babylon. I'm the guy, the reason why I've been able to own over 10, 12 businesses over the past um, 20, uh, 28 years is because I've learned how to cut out the middleman. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to pay you 70% above Watch this. this let me, can I tell y'all a secret? You know when y'all go to the store and y'all get excited because they say it's 70% off? Oh, 70% off. That's just because they was making 400% profit over you. Are y'all understanding? So you got to learn how to decrease. Somebody say decrease. decrease. Expenses. Expenses. Say it again. Decrease. decrease. Expenses. 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 Say it again. Decrease. decrease. Expenses. expenses. You got you got to be able to decrease the expenses. So, this is why setting financial goals is so important. Number one, it provides clarity and direction. Number two, not only Jonathan does setting financial goals provides clarity and direction. But it motivates action. See, when you can see it, when you can see it, and you see it working or not working, it motivates you to do something. Some of us, we're just living. We're making money, we're spending money. But we don't have an account for the money. And I, how many of you wouldn't mind being a millionaire? Okay. Here we go. Somebody said that was a dumb question. No, it wasn't. Because I told y'all I was speaking one day and somebody said she didn't want to be wealthy. It wasn't. So it could be that one in a room, right? But here, here's the deal. I was going to utilize my son um, because this is what I taught them when they were young. A million dollars begins with what? One dollar. No, it doesn't. It begins with one cent. And the reason why most people could never be wealthy is because they ignore the penny. They ignore the penny. That accountant, that CPA from Nigeria I told y'all about, he beat that in me, literally. Don, if you have a newspaper subscription and it's 35 cents a week, I want you to track it because a million dollars begins with one cent. I never, how dare I disrespect the start of a million by walking over a penny. Because if you don't respect the penny, you won't respect the middle. Listen, watch this. Listen, be faithful over a few things and I'll make you rulers over many. So financial, so when you set financial goals, number one, it provides clarity and direction. Number two, it motivates action. Number three, it helps to track progress. And number four, it enables better decision making. I, I have some time with, 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 my, with my children and they're ready to make a decision. It's three questions I have them ask themselves. Number one, what would Jesus do? Because Jesus is always going to do the right thing. Number two, what would daddy say? Okay. Daddy may not always do the right thing, but he's going to say the right thing, especially to them, right? Okay. Can we just be honest? <laughs> and, but number three, is it worth it? Okay. Every decision you make should consult your destiny before you make the decision. So when you're looking at your financial goals and you're getting ready to make a decision, Eminem, is it worth it? Is it going to push you towards your financial freedom or is it going to take you away from it? Are y'all seeing this? Yes. The next one is that it increases financial security and stability. Man, it feel a lot better knowing next month is covered. Yeah. <laughs> it, feel, it feel a lot better knowing next month is covered. 
Now, here's what we got. Here's the issue. There's five benefits of establishing a budget. Say five. five. And there's a whole bunch more. But these are the five I picked out. Number one, it reduces financial stress. When you got a budget and you know where everything is and you know how everything is, it's going to reduce financial stress. Number two is going to help you to establish those priorities we talked about. I told you some of this is going to be repetitive on purpose, right? Number three, it promotes saving. Number four, it tracks your spending. Where did that 35 cents go? Number five, it avoids overspending and NSF fees. Some of us use NSF fees like they interest rates on a credit card. <laughs> Don't y'all look at me with that tone of voice. You know what I'm talking about. No, that money not in there. You didn't calculate it. Well, it's only going to be $37 if I write this. No. Billions of dollars the banks make every year in NSF fees. And part of it is because the money we're spending is not because we need to spend it. <laughs> say, say, say this with me. Y'all read the screen for me. Say, if you don't tell your money where to go, it will follow you where your impulse leads you. If you don't tell your money where to go, it's going to follow where your impulse leads you. Gucci, Louie, Ooey. Because you know, you know they, some, some folk then found the bag lady. <laughs> it's not Louie, it's Ooey. <laughs> Y'all see what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Not because you know, he, he, can, he, can, he can take good care of you. No, no. But, but, but y'all understand. How many of you walked out the house, you didn't intend to spend it, you saw it, and said, I gotta have it. And some of our gotta have it, we ain't had it yet, it's still in the box. <laughs> Are y'all hearing me? We gotta get control, say get control, over our impulse. Is this helping you so far? This helping you? Y'all glad you came? All right, good. Yeah. I started sweating. I got nervous. I was. <laughs> so, so this is, but there's another thing for those of you that are married, for those of you that are married, having a budget is, this is what having a budget is going to do for those of you that are married. Say those of you that are married. Uh, th this is what, one thing having a budget is going to help your marriage. Can I help your marriage real quick? I want to help your marriage. Say help my marriage. It reduces spousal abuse. It got real quiet. What, what, what do you mean by that? Think about all of the hardship and the arguing and the back and forth because you don't have a budget and why did you spend that? We can't afford that. I want that. You can't have that. All of this kind of stuff happens in the context of a marriage because there was no understanding as to how we were going to handle money. Are y'all seeing this? So now you're arguing, you're saying stuff, and I'm so, some, yeah, you're lying. It never made it out the trunk. Come on, y'all. I've been doing this a long time. I'm just, to be honest with you, the stuff I'm saying is just stuff I've heard in counseling sessions. And, <laughs> are y'all understanding? So, so this is why having a budget is so important. Now listen, this is not in your book, but I want to give you this nugget, so I want you to write this down. If you are married, I want you to have a goal of living off of one, and you're in a two-income house, two household, I want you to have a goal of living off of one income. 
If you're married, I want you to live off of one income, and the second income is your, is, your, is your fortune income. It's your prosperity income. It's the income that you are investing. It is the income where you're making your money work for you. You, you you're not just going to work for money. You're going to make your money work for you. Are y'all understanding me? And, and that is where you get to go to Dubai. That's where you get to go to China. Or if, if you was my son, I'm going to Japan. That's where you'll get to go to Japan. Y'all understand? If you're married, make that the goal. Right? If you're single, I want you to live off of 60% of your income. I'm very transparent because if you, you know, the Bible said they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the words of their testimony. And so I'm very transparent. I probably tell too much. Um, you know, it is what it is. And so uh, <laughs> when, 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 when my former wife and I, when she wasn't getting along with me, that's the way to say it. She wasn't getting along with me, right? She said, if I didn't learn nothing else from you, okay. I learned about how to handle money. And what she would do literally is take 40% of her income and invest it and live off the 60. And when I tell you she would cry broke, she would cry broke when I know she got some money. <laughs> that's my homie now, but y'all understand what I'm saying? Because that's how you relieve yourself of this stress. I want you to learn how to sacrifice the pleasure of your play today. So you can live the kind of life you want to live tomorrow. Right. I'm going to say it because Meet You told me to. You, I, I want you to learn how to sacrifice the pleasure of your play today. So that you can live the kind of life you desire to live tomorrow. Hello, hello. We just went through the empowerment um, conference, the, the session about financial empowerment, uh, prosperity. I'm excited. I feel empowered. Do you feel empowered? I feel empowered. <laughs> oh, what did we learn today? Um, we learned about, uh, man, <laughs> so much stuff. I like it was so much stuff. We learned about life insurance. We learned about investing. We learned about, most importantly, uh, where we can cut costs and spending and how we can increase our money in our accounts which is how to make exactly a budget and need. everything yes. and you know we saved we realized that we can save about five to ten thousand dollars every now and again i go i, I put the whole family on a financial fast and 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 i become the no master no dad no it only costs no buy it yourself but see, the problem is I tell my kids to buy it themselves and then they, they got money. They, they go and buy it themselves. That was not what I wanted to do. But then I got, but I got a couple of sons would be like, no, that's all right. I'm good. You, you got to establish a budget, you guys. You got to establish a budget. Let's, let's move on to next. Here's the deal. Where is my money? Where's my money? See, when you're actually establishing a budget, you're able to look and see where your money is. So Josiah is my 11 year old. He makes $2,500 a month. Rachel is a 20 year old. She spends $22,000 a month in reality. <laughs> but, so their total income is $4,700. That's 100% of their income. Here's a breakdown of where the money is going. 35%, say 35%, 35%. is going to debt payments. 34% is going to living expenses, 4% savings, wow, 23% taxes, and 4% insurance. Now, this chart wouldn't be so bad if they had 34% in all of their living expenses. What, what makes this chart bad is the 35% in debt. 35% more than a third of their income every month is going to pay debt. Since we're in a church, I'll tell you, the Bible says 
that we become slaves to the creditors. So Nicole, they're not going to work to live. They're going to work to pay the slave master. Which is the creditor. Y'all see that? It's right. So we imagine what we could do if we could eliminate the debt. Re they saving $200, 4%. Wow. You'll hear some financial people tell you. The Christian folks say 10% go to God, 10% go to your savings, and then you do. They're putting 4% of all for 4%. That's two people. That's 40, that's 80 hours a week. Out of 80 hours a week, they get plus overtime, plus the headache of dealing with the boss you don't like. Y'all understanding what I'm saying? Only 4% goes to their future? Wow. Y'all don't have to tell me. Ask yourself this question. Does my stuff look like that? An average person won't know because they don't have a budget. Y'all see where we're going with this? All right. Now, real quick. How do we get rid of that debt? We get rid of debt by elimination. Somebody say elimination. Elimination. And what we want to eliminate first is the waste. But you can't eliminate the waste until you deal with the mindset. There's two kinds of mindsets of spending that we have. One is impulsive spending. Say impulsive spending. Impulsive spending. And the other one is compulsive spending. Say compulsive spending. Impulsive spending, impulsive spending refers to making unplanned purchases without careful consideration. Just look at me and don't. If you look straight ahead, won't nobody know. <laughs> <laughs> compulsive spending, also known as compulsive buying or shopping, uh, is an addiction. It's a psychological disorder. I just got to buy. I just got to do it. I got to have it. I got to. Uh, like them Reeboks back in the day. The got to have them. See? I, I had to have them. I had like 20 pair, 20 colors. Why? Because they said I had to have them. <laughs> Y'all see that? The, when you differentiate between impulsive and compulsive, uh, it affects decision making, how often you're doing it, your inability to control, the emotional factors. You know, how many of you guys, y'all shop for therapy? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Just forget it. You told on yourself. Your eyebrows are like, uh, <laughs> you shop for therapy sake. For therapy sake. You know, some people just window shopping. You don't even have no money. I know, but it's, it helps. Sometime I dream. You know, they <laughs> And me, I'm gonna be honest. I don't. I'm not. I'm not a shopper. Matter of fact, I don't really like shopping. It drives me crazy when I really need to shop. I believe it or not, and I really need to have some. I just hire somebody to help me out because I don't want to be bothered with it. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be bothered. Did I tell y'all I don't want to be bothered? But I will eat. <laughs> you can tell, can't you? <laughs> I got a hangover. I didn't even drink last night. Just looked down and just hangs over. But, but how many of us are foodies? <laughs> how many of us? Hey, listen. listen. You'll sacrifice, you'll sacrifice the cable bill for some lamb chops. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we package it, we package it. You know, you got to treat yourself. You got to treat yourself. You got to treat yourself to a cookbook and learn how to make lamb chop. <laughs> Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? I mean, foodies, we got we to gotta be careful. I'm a foodie, y'all. I enjoy I tell, I tell some folk, I say, your mortgage, you got to get a second mortgage on your home to enjoy, to be able to afford what I've been eating in my, oh, y'all, I enjoy eating. Especially when I'm stressed. Oh my God. I'm glad I'm not in a room by myself. Do I got any witnesses in here? 
<laughs> so don't, don't buy the Krispy Kremes. I'm going to eat that like popcorn. <laughs> but, but, but it's impulsive. And it's compulsive. And it's destructive. At the end of the day, it hurts us. And it hurts our future. I'm talking about self-care. <laughs> Borrowing money to pay your rent. But you got a mani petty. You better get you some Lee press ons. Can I tell your story? Can I tell your story? No, I gotta ask her permission. I ain't gonna put it out there. Because the, about the nail thing. I got, she got a lot of story I wanna tell her. That's my girl there. I'm telling you, she'll pray and prophesy you under a table. I'm trying, but, but watch this. We were, we, were, we were looking at a home, looking at homes, and she started to talk about her nails. And she said, I had to get my nails, had to do my nails. And I said, your nails look good. And she said, yeah, they look good. She said, I got the whole pack. She said, she said I do this myself. That whole pack cost me what? How much did it go? A dollar seventy cent. Oh, and y'all, show, show her your nail. Show her your nail. Her nails look better than some of y'all that had them other people do it. I'm just saying. <laughs> she got a dollar seventy cent. Come with all the styles. Don't nobody know she looked like she didn't came. Got the acrylics and all of that kind of stuff. Y'all like y'all. A dollar seven. Y'all put y'all hands together for smart people. Talking about self-care. You better learn how to take care of yourself. Now, if you can afford it, the operative word, that's different. You got a boo? I like pretty feet. Get the bucket. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Get the bucket. Let me do your nail. Come do one. Because I ain't paying for it. I'm just saying. We, 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 we got to get out of a consumer mindset. If I can do it myself, then I'm going to do it myself. And if I work hard enough, make enough money, well, I can hire, like, I don't like shopping, y'all. I'm telling you, them 800 kids that we adopted for Christmas, I ain't buy one gift. We got a shopping team that went out. Well, I bought the gift, but they went and shopped. They wrapped. And then me and my family, Christmas morning, we go knock on doors and deliver. Are y'all understanding? Yes. But in the beginning, I had to go. Let's, let's, let's move on. Because I want to help some people. Is this helping you so far? Yes. Now, one of the things that's really going to help you is this whole ideology, that's where I was going, is, 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 is this thing between what is a need and what is a want. Recognizing and addressing impulsive and compulsive spending is important. And the way that you could do it is understanding these two things. Is it a need? What is a need? Anything that you cannot live without. A need is the basic necessities for the sustainability of daily living. That's a need. I can't live without this. I need this. My daughter one day, Dad, I need. No, you don't need. You don't need nothing. You a want is something that you desire, but you can live without. Yeah. That's so true. Y'all yeah. ah. understand? So what I want you to do on the net, what I want you to do in your book, I got some, I got some pieces here that say need and want. I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to write down how much stuff that you bought because you thought you needed and put it in the want section. Mm -hmm. And then write down what your five real basic needs are. So I want you to write, these are my five needs. I, this is my gotta have it. Write it down. This is my five basic needs. Then I want you to write down what you've been buying as a need, 
which was really just a wand. Somebody said this a lot. <laughs> Lord, help us. Let's do five of the knees. I need to get my hair done. Let me tell y'all, I got three sons, and so um, as I was coming up, I would get my hair cut like every four days. And I was getting my son's hair cut, one of them every week, other two every other week. And um, this is when they was younger. Then they started making decisions. They want their hair to grow. I was almost happy. But let me tell y'all what I did. When I looked at my budget, because I track everything, I was spending about 200 and some odd dollars a month for four haircuts. For four heads, I was spending almost 200, like $75 a month. So what I did was, the la I went to the barber and I saw the clippers that he was using to cut my hair. I started asking questions. And I went and bought me some clippers. Went to swap a rama, because I didn't want to pay full price. <laughs> I'm tell I live these principles, y'all. I'm telling you, the stuff I'm teaching, I live. Went to swap a rama about clippers. And because I'm the daddy, hush, I'm cutting your hair. I want to hear it. Got on YouTube, learned how to cut their hair. And then I reallocated that money to go somewhere else. Yep. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? Yes. I needed a haircut in my mind. So I was paying. Then one day I just went bald, said forget it. Okay. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> but I really love, I enjoy the barbering experience. I get to minister to the brothers. I get to sit there and not have to do nothing. I can't really be on my phone too much. So I still go, not every four days now, right? I go on an as needed basis. And in the middle, I just kind of shave myself. Y'all see what I'm saying? So I want y'all to write it down. <laughs> We're not gonna go over it, but I want you to really think about it. How, do, how many of you um, actually found some things on your want list that you were buying as a need that you could get rid of? One, two, three, four, five, six. She over there like, oh man, why did I come here? I'm in trouble now. <laughs> yeah, because you gotta ask yourself. So, here, so every time you get ready to spend some money now, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is it a need or is it a want? And if you need help trying to figure it out because you're trying to negotiate with yourself that this is a need, I need to have this, then talk to, talk to me at break, I got you. But let's measure the impact real quick, real quick. Measuring the impact of waste. When you measure the impact of waste, really, the impact is you're wasting money. The impact is there's money in the garbage can. And, and there's several ways that we have as we get ready to close this portion out. And one of the ways I want to talk about is subscription-based waste. Subscription-based waste. Subscri subscription spending can have a significant financial impact on households as it represents a reoccurring expense that needs to be budgeted and managed effectively. So I'm gonna tell you in advance how to do it. Understand the monthly expenses, give budgeting considerations, understand the long-term long -term financial impact. What is the opportunity cost? How much is really costing me to carry this? And then you're fine and be, be, be more financially aware in managing your money. You want to be able to mitigate the potential negative financial impact that subscriptions have. All right? Now, here's what I want to do I want to give you the top 10, say the top 10, top 10. subscriptions <clears throat> that, 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 that can waste your money. Number one is gym memberships. Number one is gym memberships. Gym, gym memberships. And I, I'm telling you, I had a gym membership. 
that I forgot I had. And y'all could tell I ain't been to nobody gym. <laughs> and when I went back, El Nathan, to check it out, I started looking. I said, whoa, I called. See, I'm that dude. I said, I thought I canceled this. Matter of fact, I forgot I ordered this. I... <laughs> so they tried to get, went all the way up to upper management. I found out who I knew who the customer service VP of LA Fitness was. I wouldn't play. <laughs> Cable and satellite TV. How many of y'all are paying a, a, a crazy cable bill because you got one series that you got to see? I'm telling you. Boy, when power was on, I got to have stars. <laughs> Show me the stars. <laughs> are y'all understanding what I'm saying? You, 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 you sit there and spend all this money every month so you can watch the Hallmark channel. <laughs> and, and the truth, uh, so people heads going down. Oof, stop. <laughs> Hallmark, the Hallmark, I'm going to tell you, all the writers are the same. It's, it's going to happen around Christmas in July. Are y'all hearing me? There's a love story because she came back from New York. He came from L.A. To the small town called Pensacola. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm trying to tell you. Okay. And now you gotta save the town with a great Christmas caroling yeah. and fall in love again yeah. in one week. <laughs> it all Come on, y'all. Cancel Hallmark. I just told you the script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you looking at me with that tone, tone of voice? You <laughs> just said, watch it for free on YouTube. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Wait, this is ridiculous. Get a fire stick. Another one, magazine subscriptions. We don't even read no more. Get rid of it. Subscription boxes. You got one of them subscription boxes? I got one. So I got a subscription box, y'all. So, well, you know, depending on what organizations you're with or whoever you're supporting, um, I am a proud member of the one of the greatest fraternities on the planet, the greatest fraternity on the planet. Oh, six? Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And I get what's called an ice box. Every month. Yes, they got me. <laughs> and the way that I justify it is I am supporting the fraternity. Oh, yeah. I'm giving back to charity because I know we do good in the hood, right? It's a subscription box. Every quarter, 150 some odd dollars, they take out my account to send me this box. Now I got all these boxes, some boxes I forgot to open. Not you, man. You're right, but see, I could afford it. And I could write it off as a charitable contribution. <laughs> Video streaming services. Y'all, we tripping. And we can, we can, we pay. Netflix, I started out paying Netflix $7.99. It's $19.99 now. Y'all got Netflix, Hulu, Prime. Y'all got all of that stuff. You got to get rid of that. Meal kit subscriptions. <laughs> I'm trying. App subscriptions. Huh? Y'all, y'all. And then you know, let me tell y'all. If they ask you for, a, if they say, put your credit card information in, and if you desire to cancel, you could cancel in seven days at any time. If you don't cancel. Then it's just it's gonna. I, I got listen. I, I was I was getting my I was getting my car washed, and I said, "How much is it?" It was it wasn't my normal car wash. And young lady come out. She said, "Oh, it's twenty one ninety nine." And 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 no no she she didn't give me no butt. 
She said, you get $21.99 and you could come back and get it washed however, as often as you want um, for the entire month. Or you could go with the $24.99 and, um, and, 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 and you get the special package and you could come as often as you want for the entire month. That's how much I said. So I just pay you $21.99 and, and I could get it for the month. She said, yeah, or just pay the $17 and you got five days. So I said, oh, I'll take the $21.99. I get the whole month. She put that, she printed the thing, gave me a card. So I was cool with the card. But then she put something in the window. Oh, okay. I said, what that? <laughs> she said, this so you could come back. Uh, okay. I said, and it expires at the end of the month? She said, no, it just renews automatically. No, no, baby, get that. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Software subscription, music streaming. Who pays for music streaming when you could just go on YouTube? I got a whole, what's it? I got a Dan Johnson Worldwide playlist. Somebody put it together for me. I don't even know how to put that together. But I gave it to Jonathan. And it's all on YouTube. Ask me how much I pay. Nothing. Why are we paying stuff? So that's the top 10. I got to get out of here. It's getting late. Uh, <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> Waste elimination. In your book, what I want you to do is write down the stuff that you've been spending on subscription. Take about three minutes real quick. Yeah, write down your subscription-based waste. Write down the stuff you... My foodies, put down how much money you spend in a week on food. No, no, I want you to. This is the point. I know, Miss DT, it's going to be all right. Put it down. How much you spending on food every week is ridiculous. Impulsive and compulsive waste, subscription-based waste. Y'all know why my 11-year-old was at work Friday, yesterday? Kyle, how long did Josiah work yesterday? From 9 to what? Uh, seven. From 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., the 11 year old was at work. He was at work, at a real job. And real job, he, he worked. You wanna know why he worked? Cause every time you see me, Dad, can we go? Okay. Dad, can we get something to eat? Okay. Dad, can we? No, you know what? You spend your money. I quit. I quit you, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Write down the waste, y'all, write it down. I want you to write it down. Here's what we found, the impact of non-budget spending. The average American spends $450 per month on impulse buys that totals about $5,400 a year. Compulsive spending and shopping addiction affects 6% of the US population. Subscription-based spending has become increasingly common with American households spending an average of $237 a month which is another $2,800 a year. Y'all see that? Here's what I told y'all. I promised you that I was gonna give you a raise. How many of y'all wanna raise? Over the next 15 minutes, okay. as we get ready to prepare you for lunch, okay. what I want you to do is I want you to look at your bank account. Go online. And I want you, everything that you spent, $100 or less, that you did not budget, I want you to write it down. Because see, we got, some, we got this little card, I call them the swipe demon. Some call it the debit card. And when it's less than $100, we have the tendency to spend it faster. That $7 holler at Starbucks, we just... And that ain't everybody, some of us got smart. But I want y'all to, I, this, this is an exercise I want y'all to do. I want y'all to do it. Go to your bank accounts right now. I want you to look up the last 90 days. Identify anything less than $100 that you did not budget. And add those items up. That I didn't budget. That you did not budget for. Then I want you to add the total amount of money you save from eliminating waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? That's, the whole That's my point. That's the whole so add, uh, add it up. Okay. Add it up. 
If it don't apply to you, chill out. Relax. You got all the money. Let me hold down a couple. <laughs> but I want y'all to do it now. And then, here, here's what I just did. I got a bill. I, I meant to bring it. I got a bill while y'all looking on the line. Y'all just hear my voice while you're looking online. I got a bill, Brother Steve, from AT&T. Um, well, this is August, so it's July, um, June. My June, no, my May bill from AT&T for my phones. So I got Verizon, AT&T, Timo, y'all don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> it just depends on where I'm traveling. I get better signal. So I, won't, I never want to be without, right? But AT&T bill showed $429. That's very disrespectful. <laughs> the second month, small, it showed $379. Oh, okay. So I called. Call. I said, what was the difference between May and June? Mm -hmm. And I said, why am I paying so much? I said, how do I get this down? Yeah. I said, what promo you got? Because I got Verizon. I got two phones with Verizon. I go back. I just keep booties over there with them. Okay. And she said, let me look in your record. <laughs> Somebody enrolled you into two different programs. They should have just combined it to one. And then she said, how many phones you got with Verizon? I said, I got two. She said, if you port another phone over it, that phone would only cost you $22. Whoa. Well, Verizon, I got two, another 250 for three phones over there. I said, for real? By the time she finished, Dr. Phil, my new AT&T bill is $187 with an additional phone. There you go. Are y'all seeing this? Because I took a moment and picked up the phone. So I'm saving over almost almost nearly two hundred dollars a month yes sir yes sir times 12 is twenty four hundred dollars a year i just gave myself a raise Amen. well today i have been very encouraged and inspired because we've been able to discuss some things in regards to financial freedom prosperity and wealth and some of the things that really hit home was eliminating waste so there are things that we need to go back and look at as far as our budgets to eliminate things so that we can increase our income and decrease our expenses so i'm also excited because i know now and i know better about how to better uh, increase the things that i need to increase and I also have an understanding that I can be empowered and freed from some of these situations that cause us to be in debt when we don't have to be. So I have been empowered. Get an extra and sheet of paper. <laughs> Just for one month, yeah, the day, yeah, day. For one August, month. August was 644. That's, that's, for August. Just August. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. So six, so I'm, can I run, I'm going to round it up to 700. 700 times 12 is $8,400. Come on, y'all. Give it. Right. <laughs> so I only did my one life month, right. You only did one month? Yeah, and I spent 838 838 So we're going to say that's $800. We're going to round down, help out Jennifer, right? So we're not going to go up to $900 and then say... <laughs> 10,800. We're going to say 800 and say 9,600. Y'all give it up. $9,600 right there. I love numbers. Man, so, so $9,600 is the biggest. Just say 38. So round up. So 850. So 50 times 12 is 600. And then 8 times 12 is what? It's 8 times 12. What is it now? It's 9,600. That's $10,000. Come on, y'all. That's ten thousand dollars. Uh oh, Meech. Meech got that look. I spent twenty five hundred dollars just in the month of August, and I promise you, I feel bad. about eight hundred <laughs> of it, I probably could have pocketed. Wow. So now let me ask you, because you said something you different. Don't work a nine to five. <laughs> I feel so much better by myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let me make certain I got the math right. Let me, let me make certain I got the math right. So, 2500 Now, is that 2500 that's expenses less than $100 that you swiped, that you, that you didn't budget for? Yeah. So, $2,500 25, $2, times 12. That's 30 thousand dollars come on y'all better put your hand together because that thirty thousand you gotta see you gotta see us after this so we can show you how to take that thirty thousand invest it and begin to make that money works for you this is why we do what we do and notice this everybody they haven't picked up the phone yet to renegotiate utilities she about to renegotiate so many. You about to renegotiate so many things? Yeah, yeah. They haven't even started renegotiating utility. They haven't even looked at the bank account yet um, to get rid of the waste, to deal with the waste issue. Just right now on compulsive, impulsive, non-budgeting spending. Wow. Young lady. I just got to know. How much more money coming back into your household? Well, like just on food alone was seven hundred and twenty dollars. So you stopped that food. I, yeah, I'm still adding up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me know. No matter where we are in the presentation, put your hand up when you're ready and say, "I got my number." But listen, are y'all seeing how this works? In this room, in this room, for those that just raised their hand, that was over fifty thousand dollars put back in people bank account just because of financial literacy are y'all see what I'm saying how y'all feel somebody say empowered how y'all feel and then some of them feel a certain kind of way because they, they like damn no you shouldn't you know why you shouldn't feel defeated because now you got the information now you got the information so you got the education but we don't want education we want edu what we want edu action. So the way you benefit from your raise is change the behavior and the mindset that got you where you are. Take that money that was coming in that you didn't know where it was going out to and tell that money where to go. Because if you don't tell your money where to go, it will take you wherever your impulse leads you. And so, wow, 50000 dollars but i've had one person right here at cornerstone it was a couple when they did this exercise they literally when they did this exercise they had twelve thousand dollars over the 90 days that they could not figure out where it went because they were expenses less than a hundred dollars so the couple's not here anymore but they wind up starting a trucking company with the $48,000 that they got back in their bank account. Amen. Y'all do me a favor. Put y'all hands together for Pastor Stephen Woodrow. My brother. Let's praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. So it, this, this is a divine moment. This is a divine opportunity for us to come together and to learn about finances. But what God is doing right now, it is just an amazing thing because everything that was talked about prior to is everything that I'm going to talk about now. So we could kind of, in a sense, call this the, you, have you ever heard of the Department of Redundancy Department? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you say things over and over again, the Department of Redundancy Department, right? So what you'll find is that there's going to be some similarities behind what has already been said and what is about to be said. But it's all with the, the same purpose of us moving forward and taking control of our finances. So I'm going to talk about credit, give you a little bit background about me. So when I graduated from Chicago State University with a degree in finance, 
I wanted to go and learn about finance and work in the finance industry, right? So I wanted to go into, and I didn't realize that there was differences. There's personal finance, and then there's consumer finance. What we're talking about right now is getting a toehold on our consumer finance, and then we'll be talking a little bit more about personal finance, and you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference, but the consumer finance is where you spend your money how you spend your money. It's about debt, it's about expenses, it's about assets, it's about liabilities, it's about all those things. So I wanted to go into personal finance, but I wound up going into consumer finance. So what I did was my first job out of college was working for an automobile finance company. So I was hired into this management training program and the management training program allowed me to sit in various seats. It was a two year program and you rotated for every six months. The first six months was where I would be a, what they called a field representative. What a field representative did was go around to the various dealerships and do an audit. And you know, because that dealership doesn't own those cars on the lot. They have a loan on those cars. They're financing them. So they have to pay for those cars when they sell them to the consumer, right? So, but a part of my job also included repossessing cars. So I was the repo man in a past life. I repossessed a car in Green Bay, Wisconsin one day. So, so don't worry, I didn't, I didn't repossess cars in Illinois, I repossessed cars in Wisconsin. Repossessing cars, but I also served as a bill collector. I was the one that called people on the phone and said, you know, hey, you know, you're past due, you're 30 days past due and we need you to make a payment. When can I, when, when can I expect a payment? I was the nicest bill collector ever. Why? Because I've been there. Because not only did I make the calls, I was a recipient of the calls. Not only did I repossess a car, I had a car repossessed. And I'm not, like, I'm not gonna ask everybody to just tell me about your story, anything like that, but here's my background. Bill collectors call, car repossessed, been evicted. I've had some financial challenges, which is why I'm so passionate about speaking about this right here. So even with what he was saying about, you know, this bio and I only put it there because he asked for it. But what I am, I'm a servant of the most high. That's what I hang my hat on, is that I am a servant of God. Credit basics, credit basics. Credit is what is really kind of causing confusion in the financial world. How many of you all, just by a show of hands, when you graduated from high school, you knew what credit was and you knew how credit worked. <laughs> Nobody, right? They didn't teach us about credit in school. My first introduction to credit was after I got discharged from the United States Army and got my first job. I went to Carson Peary Scott and they gave me a credit card. I even know what I charged. I bought a Gucci watch and then something happened. I got this thing in the mail and it was saying that I owed something. I'm like, what do you mean owed something? What, what do I have to pay? They didn't tell me that I had to pay this thing back. <laughs> so needless to say, that was my first default. When you don't pay, what happens is your account goes into default and then it goes to the collection agency, right? So what has happened is that people have not been informed about what credit is, how to utilize it appropriately, so then we wind up starting out the gates with bad credit and then because we don't understand how it works, then we have to rebuild. And then in the rebuilding, because this thing is tricky all the way around. And when I say tricky all the way around, we live in a country that is built on what? Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is really about trying to get into your pocket. This is how to feed the beast. This is how to continue to allow this country to exist. So if they're not getting money from you, then this thing falls apart. 
So what is happening is they put up tricks, very subtle tricks all along the way as it relates to finance, credit, debt, all this stuff. Matter of fact, I was talking with Sister Gwen and we used to attend the same church together at Victory Apostolic Church over in Massey. But I say that when individuals wind up into financial hardships, some of the responsibility falls on the individual, but not the entire responsibility. Why do I say that? Do you know that we are inundated with 3,000 marketing messages a day? All we experience each and every day are advertisements. What are the advertisements trying to do? Trying to get you to spend your money on something. Anybody remember Promise Keepers back in the day? It was a men's group and they were at Soldier Field back in the 90s and I'll never forget that there was a brother there who was talking about personal finance and he said that what happens when we're talking about finance is that they try to get you to spend money you don't have to buy things you don't need to impress people that you don't know. That's what America is. America, your success is about your appearance. If you appear like you have money, then you will be looked at as a success according to American standards. But when I was working for the finance company, I realized something. Because not only did I go repossess cars, and not only did I call people on the telephone and ask them for their payments, because if we couldn't get them on the telephone, you know what we did? We went and knocked on the door. Couldn't do it in Chicago, but you can do it in Wisconsin. <laughs> Probably can't do it in Wisconsin now, but we're talking about the 90s. And I'll never forget, I went to a lady's house because she had a car, a Mercedes Benz that she was not paying the note on. And because I had the information about the actual deal itself, that this was a used Mercedes that she had purchased. She had purchased it for $35,000. The interest rate was something like 29%. And she had financed it for up to six years. And six years was, was considered extensive at that time. Now they're doing seven and eight years. But her note was, and this is in the 90s, her note was $1,000 a month. And the house that I went to knock on the door was not an exceptional house. It was a house in the hood. But she felt like she had to drive a certain way. And I got a friend, he, he owns the dry cleaners. And this guy drove a used Honda that was held together by duct tape. And he said that he had learned from a man Never drive better than you live. But if we get caught up in this trap of trying to impress people that we don't know with money that we don't have, we will be the ones to suffer the consequences, which is why this knowledge makes so much sense. So let's give a hand to Brother Dan, Pastor Dan, and all those that will be presenting, and to you all, because you have the wherewithal and the fortitude to come and to learn about these things. What amount is that? Is that true? One trillion dollars. You know, we've been watching the lottery and we saw it go up above, you know, like above a billion. We like, man, that's, 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 that's some loot right there. Twelve digits. We, we typically think about seven digits. Seven digits, you mean we're in that million dollar stratosphere, right? That's twelve digits. One trillion dollars. Why do I have one trillion dollars up there? Debt for the United States? He said it's the debt for the United States. Anybody else? I was saying, I was saying, uh, the national debt? He said the national debt. Is that what you meant? You meant the national debt? Credit card debt. This is how much Americans are carrying in credit card debt right now today. The Federal Reserve just released that information about a day or two ago that one trillion dollars, this is historical, this has never happened in the history of America that so many people are carrying so much debt. 
one trillion dollars. That is just amazing when you think about it. One trillion dollars. And somebody's got to pay for it. And it's got to be paid back. So you can't think like me when I, you know, when I go get that Carson Peary Scott card and not pay it back. This has got to be paid back somehow, some way. So, you know, what is credit? And again, this is, this is about credit basics. What credit actually is. Credit is a contract agreement. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one slide. A contract agreement in which a borrower receives a sum of money or something of value and repays the lender at a later date, generally with interest. What we used to call, or you know, our parents used to call buying on time, right? Or, you know, we, we, we get it in advance. There used to be something called a layaway, right? You know, well, it not used to be, it still is. And this is, this is a nice little plug because, again, we have to be forward thinking. Emergencies typically carry a dollar sign with them. We're going to talk about emergency in, in just a moment. But Christmas is not an emergency unless you wait until the week before Christmas to shop. So when they talk about Christmas in July, think about Christmas in August. We should be right now establishing a budget for Christmas, what we're going to spend, who we're going to spend money on, how much we're going to allocate towards them so that what? So that Christmas does not become an emergency. So this whole thing about credit, this is when people spend so much money on credit is around Christmas time, anniversaries, birthdays, holidays. Every year, we know these dates are coming. Why do they sneak up on us and catch us by surprise? If we just be a little bit more thoughtful, then we can plan accordingly. Next slide, please. So when we talk about credit, and again, it's paying for something that you know, uh, we'll have to pay interest on. Uh, you can almost look at like, anybody understand this concept of sharecropping? Somebody said, yeah. Sharecropping in the past was a way that you kept people in perpetual debt. That's kind of what's happening right now. People are forced into perpetual debt. Do you know how much your minimum payment is on a credit card? I mean, from a percentage point. How much, because regardless of what the balance is, you have that minimum payment. That minimum payment is typically 2%. 2%. Why is it 2%? <laughs> you said, keep you in debt. Keep, keep you in debt. If you, if, if you focus in on paying that minimum amount, it will take you years to pay that, I mean, to pay it off without purchasing anything else. It's designed to keep you in perpetual debt. This is one of the things we have to be careful of. How many of you all have maybe children in college right now? Or, okay. So as Sister Gwen and I, we were talking and she mentioned about these notices that come in the mail, these credit card notices. This is the trick. Everything is tricky, at least I think it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think that a lot of, you know, it's almost like being paranoid. Just because I'm paranoid don't mean they are not after me. <laughs> so they're coming for your money. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because when we think about college students, they need what? They need money. They need money to eat, <laughs> to live off of, and things of that nature. And the credit card companies realize that. But they also know something psychologically, and this is one of the things that we have to you know, taking into consideration when we're talking about finances, there is this psychological component to it. The credit card companies are trying to get you to take out the credit card while you're in college because 
that is a cash cow for them because typically that first credit card that individuals get, they will hold on to that for their entire lives. So they want to be the first one to the party because if you hold on to it for your entire life out of loyalty, guess what? That means they're going to make money for a very, very long time. In addition to repossessing cars, in addition to being a telephone collector, I was also a credit card credit analyst. I worked for, it was uh, a credit card company called Elon Credit Cards, Elon Financial. Was a part of First Star Bank up there in Wisconsin. I knew, you, you know how much income a, a, a college student had to be able to show in order to qualify for a credit card? She said $20. 200 But all, you didn't even have to have a job. All you had to do was say the $200 was coming from your parents and it couldn't be verified. So guess what? They got the credit card. So they're starting out the gate trying to get you, trying to hook you. You know, they got the hook in your mouth. Now all they got to do is what? Reel you in. But now the thing is, is that not only does it happen when we're young, it happens when we're more seasoned as well. Because there's tricks that are out there. We talked about, and we'll, we'll discuss this a little more as well. I came out of the automobile industry, right? You know one of the worst things in the world for you to do when you're shopping for a car? When that salesman comes out to you and says, well tell me, what, what, what kind of payment are you looking for? <laughs> Don't ever tell them that you're looking for a payment. Because once you say, what payment you can pay, they will work that deal to their advantage because what? You haven't asked about the price of the car. You haven't asked about the interest rate. You haven't said anything about the down payment. You haven't said anything about those things that really influence how much you're going to pay. You said, I can afford this. So with that, they're going to do what? They're going to jack up your interest rate. They're going to jack up the price of the car. They're going to make it for an extended period of time. So instead of being 60 months, they're going to make it 72 or 84 months that you're going to be on the hook for this car long before, you know, after it has reached its useful life and has any kind of value associated with it. Every, all this stuff is tricky. I remember in high school, I had an accounting professor, and he used this term called caveat emptor. Any know what, anybody knows what caveat emptor means? Yes. Buyer beware. Buyer beware. And we have to be on our guard at all times because those, that system that we've been born into is trying to pickpocket us at every moment. So the types of credit. You have installment debt, you have revolving debt, and then you have mortgages. Installment debts are, you know, you have a set amount, and then you have a period of time, and then you pay that debt over, systematically over that period of time until it's paid off. Revolving debt, however, it goes up and it goes down based off your credit limit. Up and down. In, in a sense, it's almost like a gun. It reloads. So you can pay it down, but unless you have the discipline, you'll charge it back up again. And you'll keep doing this. Matter of fact, so not only did they say that there was a trillion dollars worth of debt that's outstanding right now, but they're saying that almost 50% of Americans carry a balance. And 60% of those that carry a balance, they carry it for over a year. So in a sense, what is happening is that the debt is perpetual. And they're the ones that's making the money, and we're the ones that are suffering the consequences of it. So revolving debt can continue to increase, decrease, increase, decrease, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever pay just 2%. Because if, if you choose to pay 2% on your credit card, your credit card has, in a sense, become a mortgage. Yeah. And the reason I say a mortgage is because 
that's the other kind of debt, mortgage. Mortgage on a home, right? And typically the mortgage is how long? How long does the mortgage last? 30 years. 30 years. So if a mortgage lasts for 30 years, let's say you buy a $300,000 house and you take out a 30 year mortgage. Over the course of that 30 years, how much will you have paid? My brother says at least 600,000. Anybody else? Yeah, I know it's over double. It's triple. Okay. Yeah. Over the course of 30 years, on a $300,000 house, you would have paid for that house plus two more. You would have paid $900,000 and, you know, you would have paid the $300,000 for the house, but you would have paid $600,000 in interest. Here's a, here's, a, here's a trick for you. So if you have a mortgage, and what, we would pay one payment every 12 months, right? How many weeks in a year? 52. 52, okay. Now, if we decided that instead of paying, you know, one mortgage payment every month, but I'm gonna pay half of the mortgage payment every two weeks, because how many weeks in a month? How many weeks in a month? 4.4, 4.3. So in a sense, what you're doing is, if you pay half your mortgage payment every two weeks, you in a sense make 13 payments a year instead of 12. What difference does that additional payment make? A lot. Because it turns a 30 year mortgage into a 19 year mortgage without causing any undue stress, any undue pressure. This is just a strategy because, you know, when we talking about this, this word mortgage, do, do you see uh, like a root word in there somewhere? More. Mort. Mort, like mortality. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they, they just, they, they're, they're giving you on the hook for your, basically the, for your entire life. <laughs> that's, where, that's where it comes from. It comes from this word morte, which means death. Yeah. That's where mortgage comes from. See, if you don't remember nothing else today, you can remember <laughs> Pastor Steve said, I'm on this thing until I die. Nah, I'm not saying that. I'm giving you strategies where you can get where you can free yourself sooner. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain that part when you mentioned about paying it twice or every two weeks? So if the mortgage is twenty five hundred for that month, you're saying pay the seventeen fifty every two weeks. Okay. Right. Every two weeks because what's going to happen is because there's fifty two weeks in a year, right? So that means that you're going to pay, you know, half twenty six times over the year. Half twenty six times over the year equals thirteen full payments. So instead of paying. 12 payments, you have in a sense made 13 payments, and just by making one additional payment per year, you have actually cut your, uh, your mortgage down from 30 years down to 19. Just a simple way of managing debt, eliminating and not having to deal with all that mortgage payment for that 30 year period. You remember when Pastor Dan, when he was mentioned about uh, you know, you have a car as an asset, you have a home as an asset, but then it's also a liability at the same time. It's that, that underlying loan that purchases that asset that creates the liability. So for a home, that liability is the mortgage. That's what secures the loan. For a car, it's that auto loan that secures the asset. Now, it's a little easier to qualify for a secured loan because it is underwritten by the asset because if you don't pay, the, pay for the asset or you didn't, don't pay for the loan, then what happens? Steve, come and get your car. No, I'm out of, I'm out of the repo business. <laughs> but that's what they'll do. They'll come and get your car. But they can't come and get your home. So what do they do? They foreclose, right? And then they go through a legal process to remove you from the property. And it might take a little while. Anybody know about PMI? 
private mortgage insurance. So the real estate agent, you know, I am a realtor. <laughs> now, who does who does private mortgage insurance benefit? Them. Not us. Them. But who pays for it? We do. We do. So if we default on that loan, when you're talking about being in a win-win situation, it's like, what well, we gonna take the house back, plus we gonna get paid because you didn't pay. And then where are you at? On the street. I'm telling you, this thing is tricky. It is absolutely tricky. So secured has an underlying asset or collateral which secures the loan, unsecured, it's a revolving line, a credit card, or what we call a signature loan. Basically, you are, in a sense, signing for this loan just on your good looks. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh at that, but <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> now, but it is based on something. Why would somebody give you some money without securing it with an asset? That's because you've proven yourself to be reliable. You've proven yourself to be faithful. You've proven yourself to be a person of good character. So what we'll do is we will, in a sense, go ahead and extend some credit to you. And we will allow you to pay us back on time. But when we give you this money, because we are taking on certain risks, what we want to do is we want to be compensated for the risk that we're taking on. So if you are a good risk, I will charge you little money. If you are a bad risk, I will charge you a lot of money. So it makes sense for us that what? We should have and manage credit in a responsible way so that we can always get the best interest rate possible. Who determines your credit and what actually happens. Every time you fill out an application, does it feel like you're giving up too much information? Yes. Yeah. And you are. You're giving up this information and every time that you fill out an application, what happens is that information gets reported to the credit bureau or the credit reporting agencies and they are what? Equifax, Experian and also TransUnion. So credit reporting agencies are generally for-profit companies. They're in the business of making money. Making money by collecting your data and selling it to somebody else. They gather and sell information about a person's credit history. So not only are they selling it, they're gathering it, they're all in cahoots. They're saying that what we'll do is we're going to you know, give this person this loan, and then how they respond to the loan, how, how responsible they are, what we're gonna do is we're gonna report it back to you so that you can sell it to somebody else. All of this is, again, designed to help them and potentially help you, but only help you if you manage it responsibly. So who buys your credit information? Because again, it's being sold because the credit bureaus are for-profit agencies and this is, this, is, this is what they do. This is how they make their money. So what they do is they sell it definitely to banks, anybody that's gonna ex extend a loan, anybody that's gonna extend credit, they're purchasing this information to determine your credit worthiness to see if in fact they're taking on undue risk by loaning you this particular money. So banks, car dealers, department stores, mortgage lenders, credit unions, credit card companies, debt collectors. So even in fact, if let's say that you don't pay a, you know, a particular loan and it goes into default, now the credit agency or the, the debt collectors come into play, they buy that debt for pennies on the dollar and then they come back to you and say that you have to pay as if you owe this full amount. When they bought it, they bought your $10,000 debt for $200. And now they're coming at you saying that you owe $10,000. So they're selling it to the debt collectors. They're selling it to landlords. If you are going to rent an apartment, the landlord does a credit check on you to again, what? Determine your credit ability to see if you are a good risk. Also insurance companies. Do you know that your credit could potentially affect your ability to purchase home insurance? to purchase car insurance, 
and to purchase life insurance? See, the life insurance companies, they got it smart. Because how many times have you heard where somebody was in financial straits and then somebody comes up missing? And then somebody, you know, when they came up missing, they, they can tell that you were checking with the insurance company to see what the, what the, uh, you know, what the face amount of the policy was. And they utilize that in court because you were the one that actually set that person up. So they have what they call a, and somebody's going to be talking about life insurance in, in, in a moment, but they have this, this clause. It's called a non-contestability clause. You know what a non-contestability clause does? It is basically when a person buys a two-year, a, a, a life insurance policy, there is a two-year period where if a person commits suicide within that two years, the insurance company is not going to pay. They're not going to pay for that life insurance policy within that first two years. But if somebody's really desperate, and this has happened, is that somebody will wind up and kill themselves two, day, two years and a day later, once that non-contestability clause has expired, in order to be able to get that money. People do strange things when it comes to money. So not only insurance companies and employers. So when you get that letter, if a person does not have the, let's say the best credit, and you get that letter saying that they have decided to move in another direction, that they didn't necessarily consider your resume, they check your credit. And if that credit wasn't appropriate, if that credit wasn't tight, then they might have passed on you for that employment opportunity. Credit reports. This is what a credit report actually contains. It is almost like your whole life in a nutshell. So it's going to talk about really your credit worthiness because it's tracking you like how you're making your payments. Are you, have, you, have you been late? Late is considered 30 days past due, 60 days past due, 90, 120 days past due. Once it gets beyond 90, you know, typically that lender is probably going to write it off. Then it's going to go into default. It goes to the, credit, the, the uh, debt collector, the debt collector purchases it for pennies a dollar, and now they start hounding you. But also it's used for you know, employment purposes. It houses that information. So you know, if you sit up there and you fill out an application and you put what your current employer is, and then also the amount that you make, that information gets reported to the credit bureau and it becomes a part of your credit file. Your position, also your salary, address, current and former addresses. If you file bankruptcy, it's going to be there. And we know that bankruptcies last pretty much about seven to 10 years on your, on your credit bureau, right? And then judgments. And then liens also. But now fortunately, you know, what does not appear as far as lien is federal tax liens. So there was something that was done, uh, some legislation that keeps federal tax liens off of your credit report. Psalm 3721, the wicked borrow and do not pay back. But the righteous are generous and giving. The righteous are generous and giving. You know, we're committed to honoring our obligation because, you know, as the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, so us being responsible with our debts is allowing our light to shine. You know, I thought about this maybe some years ago. What if, you know, when I had bill collectors calling me, what if it was somebody from the church that was on the other end calling me? How would I look? How would I appear? How would this affect my witness that I can't pay my bills? But this is a powerful, powerful scripture. So what goes into credit? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a credit score. Everybody knows about this FICO thing, right? But before there was a FICO score, as a credit analyst, we would look at your credit bureau, at your credit report, and we would take into consideration what we call the five C's. The five C's, and we can determine these five C's based upon looking at your credit report. One is your credit. You know, how you're making your payments, how much debt you actually have, how much is your, your, your utilization. But then also the collateral. 
So those secured loans, when they're secured by either a, a house or a car or some other type of property. But then also, it used to be cash because you would disclose on your credit application how much you actually had in your checking account or how much you actually had in your savings account. And then also character. How are you meeting your obligations? Are you faithful? Are you a good credit risk? Because you make your payments on time. So credit report versus credit score. Credit report contains trade lines. What that is is that every open account that you have will appear in your credit report. And not only every open line you have, but also some closed accounts as well. And all that information resides there that a lender will actually look at. And what does it say? It contains personal information as well, details regarding how a person handles credit and honors their obligations. It's going to show the balance, the number of payments made, the number of payments late, if the account was closed and written off, and when did that take place. This thing follows you around like a little lost puppy and you can't get away from it. You can look surprised, but it follows you. And then, so that's the credit report. The credit report is everything that you have open and what you have recently closed. And then there's a credit score. What is the credit score? This is when we come into that FICO score. FICO actually comes from this, it's a name. It was two individuals that started this company. It was called the Fair Isaac Company. It was Bill Fair and Earl Isaac. Bill Fair was an engineer, Earl Isaac was a mathematician. And they started this company in 1956 with the whole premise that you can make better financial and business decisions as an entity if you utilize and compile data on individuals. So that's where this FICO score, this Fair Isaac Company score actually comes from. And I know that you have these other uh, opportunities, other scores that are out there, you know, experience boost and all that. <laughs> all that's fine, but typically the lenders are utilizing as a standard the FICO score. That is the industry standard. That is the score that you want to try to influence. You don't want to pay somebody to automatically just boost your score without doing anything. You want to incorporate certain behaviors that will positively impact and influence your credit score. So again, your credit score is a mathematical algorithm that takes into account the various components of a person's credit report. Basically those five C's, so instead of somebody looking at it and making a determination, the, basically the algorithm or the equations get populated in and then it spits out a score or a scale predicting a person's potential credit worthiness. Here is what is considered good scores, exceptional scores, very good scores, fair scores, and poor scores. When I show this, what is it, 60, what, 67% of people fall within exceptional, very good, and good in America. Mm -hmm. So what, 33% fall within that poor or that fair range. This has changed. Mm -hmm. They've moved the goalposts. So what was considered, and I had this from a presentation that I did in 2012. In 2012, so it says 800 to 850 is considered excellent. In 2012, over 750 was considered excellent. Mm -hmm. So what happens? is that if 750 was considered excellent in 2012, but now 800 is, that means if you fall now in 770, you pay a higher rate because you're no longer excellent. They moved the goalpost. So what was considered very good was 740 to 799 right now. Good was 721 and above 10 years ago. Good, 670, good was considered 660. 
So what they're doing is they're now charging higher interest rate for individuals that really have some good credit. Really have some good credit. And this is what we need to take in consideration when we're thinking about how to improve, how to maintain our credit. This really kind of breaks down and shows the weighting of how various things impact your credit. First and foremost, the most heavily weighted item is your payment history. How you make your payments. And the thing about that is, is that if you miss a payment now, that missed payment will affect your credit score for the next two years. It might have been totally accidental, but it's going to impact negatively your credit score for the next two years. So payment history is huge. 35% of your credit score is based off your payment history. And you will be able to see when you pull your credit report, and I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a moment, when you pull your credit report, how many times you've been over 30 days past due. 30 days past due is when it gets reported to the credit bureau and starts to negatively impact your credit score. Then 30% is the amount owed. The amount owed is, that's your limit, that's called your credit utilization. Your credit utilization impacts your credit score almost to the same degree as payments. So when it comes to credit cards, whatever your credit limit is, let's say if there's a thousand dollar limit on your credit card, in order for it to be looked at favorably, you need to have that credit card balance below $300. It needs to be below 30%. 30% and above starts to negatively impact your credit score. So they're utilizing or looking at your credit utilization. And then also your credit mix, you know, is it revolving, is it installment, whatever. Also the, the length of your credit history. And this is gonna be important as well because, you know, as you have done, you have identified additional money. And hopefully you're gonna utilize that additional money to pay down some debt. And then when you pay off that credit card, you're gonna to wanna to close it, right? No. no, don't close it, why? Because, absolutely, because the length of time that that account was opened impacts your credit history, your credit score positively. So you don't want to close it, hold on to it so that it positively impacts your credit score. And then also new credit. You know, it talks about inquiries. When you apply for credit, that's, that's called a hard hit. You know, you, you now have applied for more credit. Why does that impact your credit score? Why does an inquiry impact your credit score? Because there might be uh, an indication that you want to take on new debt. Indication you want to take on new debt. And why would you want to be wanting to take on new debt? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you don't have the income coming in like you did. So why not go ahead and apply for a credit card and allow that credit card to go ahead and float your lifestyle for a while? Or I know I'm not gonna be able to afford this car, so let me go ahead and get it now. And they know when you're shopping, they know when you're doing all this stuff. And that's how the credit, uh, you know, like the new credit application impacts your credit score. Steps to better credit. These are the things that you can do to improve your credit standing. And I wanna share this, and I wanna share this, and I hope you hear me. You have these things out called credit repair agencies. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question. I just started following this guy who uh, deals with credit, and uh, he, he, what he was saying is that uh, when you take out a credit card, say you have $1,000, he said um, use, use $1,000 but be able to pay it off all at one time so that it, it, it looks good and even if like you wanted to apply for more credit, you know, they'll be able to give it to you. So that's kind of the model that we've been trying to follow in our house. Before it was use the 30 the 30 percent. Mm -hmm. If you're only using 30 percent, you know, you know, the banks, how can they trust you with more? 
Right. Like that. Right. Absolutely. So he was mentioning about, you know, paying off your credit card, you know, each and every month. That is a great thing to do. Go ahead and pay it off every month if that's in fact what you can have the ability to do. Pay it off every month. And you know what they call in, in the industry, you know what they call a person that actually pays their credit card off every month? Huh? A loser, bro. She said a loser. They're not making no money. So. <laughs> Anybody? so what do they call a person that pays off their credit card debt every month? We said a loser. You got loser going once. What do you say? They don't like it. They don't like it. Why? Because they're not making money off you, right? They're not making interest off you. You know what they call a person that pays off their credit card debt every month? A deadbeat. <laughs> they call them a deadbeat because you have, in a sense, have figured out the system, and now the system that we're trying to game, you're gaming on us. That's what we should be doing, paying off our credit card debt every month, but again, and that's going to that's going to impact your credit score positively, but definitely looking at that credit utilization. So obtain a copy of a credit report. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. How many of you all within the last 12 months have gotten a copy of your credit report? Excellent. What did you say? Have gotten a copy of your credit report. You're talking like outside of like credit karma and like all those things. That's why credit score. Yeah. Annualcreditreport.com. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to make sure that your payments are being reported, that something doesn't appear on there that should not be there, because they have this thing out called identity theft, right? For the life of me, I don't see how anybody can open up a, you know, uh, obtain a mortgage in somebody else's name without pro with providing all the, the required documentation. But it happens because of identity theft. So you want to make sure and check your credit report and you should do it every year. Every year you get a free credit report. But now, because of COVID, you are allowed to get a copy of your credit report, an online version of your credit report, every week. Because when, during, when COVID hit, the crooks got real creative. So you want to make sure that you are checking your credit report at least once a year, if not more. Then, I'm sorry, go back. Assess your financial situation. I was talking about the budgeting. That's so important. Because this is an extremely important part of your financial life, your financial health, is that you are monitoring and assessing your financial situation. I don't have this in my notes. I, I work in nursing education. Any nurses in the room? So when a nurse is taking care of you, they follow what they call a nursing process. And in that nursing process, it's a systematic way to actually address whatever concerns you have. So I like to say is this acronym called ADPI, A-D-P-I-E. What does ADPI actually mean? It means assess, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate. So you can go ahead and throw that, that nursing process onto your finances. You want to assess your finances, right? You want to diagnose your financial health. You want to plan, implement strategies to improve your financial health implement them, and then evaluate every year. Just like you pull in your, your credit bureau or your credit report every year. You know the really like the only financial uh, thing that people do each and every year is? File their taxes. That's what they do because they want to get that return. So you got to have some incentive there. The incentive for you is improve financial health. Make all your payments on time. We said that's a 35% waiting. Pay down your revolving loan balances. That's that credit utilization. Do not close your older accounts. Again, longevity has its place. Sound like Martin Luther King. Um, Y'all did catch that, right? <laughs> Everybody would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. All right. And <laughs> do not make any new debts. Stop the madness. Stop the madness. Don't create any more new debts. Yes, next, next slide, please. Were you about to say something about credit repair? At one oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Credit repair. If you go to a credit repair company, 
they will charge you anywhere from $350 to $5,000. To do what? To give you this information I'm giving you right now for free. Everything that a credit repair agency is going to do is what you have within your power to be able to do. So you exercise agency. So when you get your credit report and you see that the fact that maybe something's on there that shouldn't be on there, you write the credit bureau at that information, at that address right there, and you dispute, because that's what they do. What they do is they dispute everything. But see, the credit bureaus have gotten smart. They know that individuals are disputing everything, so they basically classify it as being frivolous, and they don't even pay any attention to it. Now, go ahead and challenge the things that are you know, inaccurate because they are inaccurate. And the Fair Credit Reporting Act basically requires that they have to respond within 30 days. So you don't want to pay for something that you can do for yourself. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is it, is it true that on your credit report, law states that... Um, you shouldn't, well, on your credit report, it shouldn't be like uh, uh, your payment history between you and, and a consumer. Like uh, the guy that I follow is saying that it's pretty much illegal for a company to report a late payment on your credit report. He gave like the article section number, and I, I can't remember, but mm -hmm. that's what he's saying. I don't know if that's accurate because there are laws that are on the books like the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that basically provides the federal guidelines for reporting information. Now what they cannot do is report inaccurate information, which is why if you write them and dispute it, that they have to by law to remove it. But no, that information is there and that's why these companies actually exist. Now, there's, there was a breach with Equifax in 2017 and this is a way that a lot of individuals were able to get, you know, again, free credit reports, free credit scores, things of that nature. So, you know, there, there are some things that are out there now by law that you can actually take advantage of. Great question, though. So this is how you get a copy of it. Go out to annualcreditreport.com or you can call by phone at 877-322-8228 or you can actually send it by snail mail as well. Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Trinity United Church of Christ over there on 95th, he was doing a great thing because what he did was he purchased people's medical debt for pennies on the dollar and wiped it off. Wiped it off. So when we're looking at things that we can do to assist, you know, so I forgot how much it was. It was like millions of dollars in debt that he purchased for pennies on the dollar and then sent a letter out to these people saying that Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. Hey. Amen. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Since you mentioned that, well, two questions. So um, during COVID, this is, I was told that um, medical debt would be, would be wiped, off, wiped off after April of I think it started April 2023, not to pay if you have old medical debt that they did not have to be paid because there was something that, was, that they were trying to pass where they would pay it off. I'm not, that. I'm not fully sure of that, but I do remember reading something about that. Just like with the federal tax loans or federal tax liens, that that can no longer be reported. I believe that even with the medical debt, that that's the case too. When you're talking about ag aggressive, uh, like reporting tactics, medical debt. If you don't pay that, like within 30 days, they they sell it to the credit bureau. I mean, sell it to a debt collector, and then that it pops up on your credit report. So that may have something to do with that, and I'll have to explore that, you know, a little more. And my other question was about the credit cards. So um, also, and this is only because I was. Um, we were doing some work with a, a loan officer at one point, and one of the things that she said was there was a credit card, it was like a very low amount. She said, if you have a low credit card, like $300, and you're getting charged an annual fee, so now you got $300, they're taking $95 a year, plus you have a 29 point something, something percent, mm -hmm. you really, you know, like really, you really, you really pay it now. Mm -hmm. um, for this $300 that you're supposed to be getting. Um, if you have that card within that year, 
if if it's in a within a year or less than two years that you you should close that particular type of car and it won't affect you right is that in a case like that because all this is not set in stone but there are going to be instances like that where you know Pretty much 30% of your balance or your credit limit is for a uh, you know annual fee. In that case, you know consider how this will impact your you know your credit score, and it may well be worth it because paying $95 for a $300 limit is definitely not worth it. That's criminal, actually. They're selling it is they're telling you that this is how you build your credit. So these are the credit cards they're posting saying build your credit, build your credit. They give you these. Little, little amount. You start off with the little right. amount, and you get there. You start building your credit. Right. So, one of the ways to do that and bypass that is get you a secured credit card. Yeah. Go out to here's a website for you. I'm sorry, Pastor Dan. How much time do we have? Are we kind of at time right now? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> so I'll be. So I'm good. He he said I'm, I'm at time, but I'm good. That means go ahead and wrap up, dude. Um, <laughs> bankrate.com bankrate.com will have a listing of the best credit cards the lowest rate the best rewards no fee uh, zero percent transfer fees things of that nature bankrate.com and then also lendingtree.com so you'll be able to see a listing of credit cards that you can potentially use Romans 13 and 8 let no debt remain outstanding except continue the debt of love. I heard somebody say that earlier today. You know, we owe, owe nobody except to love. Love them, love them, love them with the love of the Lord. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Can you speak to the, the variation of the FICO score? There's FICO score 8, there's FICO score 3, there's Advantage score 2. Can you speak to that because different lending agencies utilize the different FICO scoring metrics. Correct. And they do. And you don't know what that, what's included in that metrics. Okay. So you have to go with the best thing that you have available to you, which is that FICO score that you can actually get. Because each lender, because again, you know, those credit bureaus are in the profit, you know, they're, they're for-profit companies, right? FICO, or the Fair Isaac Company, is a for-profit company because not only are they selling, you know, like the credit bureaus are selling your information, they're selling algorithms to the lenders based upon a lender's requirements. So they will actually set up a scoring system for the individual lender based off of what they deem to be most important. So it's going to vary, but for you as a consumer, the best thing that you're going to be able to have is that general FICO score. Not, like I said, not an Experian boost or not something that is just boosting your credit score just by you, you know, sending a check or providing additional information. That is the score that you will want to utilize, which is your typical FICO score. And you go out to FICO.com and, you know, you can pull that information there or even from free annual or annualcreditreport.com. You can get a credit score, which is going to be coming from the credit bureaus, but you'll have to pay for it. It's a small fee, less than $10, but you're still going to have to pay for it. So that's a great question. This right here, strategies to pay down your debt. Pastor Dan, he blessed you all, helped you to find $50,000. $50,000 that you walking past and you just picked it up off the ground. I don't know about you all, I walk with my head down, I'm looking for money all the time. What, that looks like a dollar bill? Oh. Utilize some of that money to pay down your credit cards. There's two ways you can actually do it. One is called the snowball, one is called the avalanche. What is the snowball? One thing you want to do is you want to make a list of all your credit cards. Make a list of your credit cards, the balances, the interest rate, and then your payments. Snowball says you make the minimum payment on all your credit cards, but you identify one, typically with the lowest balance, and you go ahead and you pay that one off first. So any additional money that you have that you found, you know, like from those subscriptions, because there is a scripture in, in Song of Solomon 2.15, 
it said it is the little foxes that destroy the vine. So it's those subscriptions that are really kind of impacting you financially. So you take that money that you found and apply that to your credit card to pay down that debt. Once that credit card has been paid down, then take that amount and then take that minimum amount that you were paying on that credit card and then you pay off the next credit card, the next highest one. And you continue to do that until you pay it off. So that's a systematic way of doing it. Sometimes they differ in how, do you, do you do it with the lowest balance or do you do it with the highest interest rate? Well, your highest interest rate might be killing you if you have a high balance on that credit card. So it might pay to just go ahead and start paying on your highest interest rate card and then once that's paid off, take that additional money and pay off the next highest and the next highest and the next highest. So one is called the snowball, where you go ahead based off the, the, the balance of the card, or the other one is called the avalanche, where you choose based off of the interest rate of the card itself. But now here's what I suggest, because sometimes there's this psychological aspect to paying down your credit cards. So if your lowest one is $600, as far as the balance, but you have a high interest rate credit card with a big balance, go ahead and pay off that $600 just so that you get some psychological, you know, uh, you know, juice going there, you know, where you feel like you're accomplishing something. So this is almost like a hybrid method. So I don't know if you call it a, a, a snow avalanche or a, a ball, whatever, but, but incorporate that, you know, so you want to make sure you're feeling, you know, some type of positivity around achieving your financial gains and your financial, financial odds. This is a quote from the first millionaire in the United States. And it says, there are two ways of being happy. We may either diminish our wants or augment our means. I don't know if you remember, uh, Pastor Dan was saying that there's two ways, right? Increase your income or, or decrease your expenses, right? So that's what they're saying. Either diminish your wants or augment your means. Either will do. The result is the same. And it is for each man to decide for himself and do that which uh, happens to be the easiest. If you are idle or sick or poor, however hard it may be to diminish your wants, it will be harder to augment your means. If you are active and prosperous or young and in good health, it may be easier for you to augment your means than to diminish your wants. But if you are wise, you will do both at the same time, young or old, rich or poor, sick or well. And if you are very wise, you will do both in such a way as to augment the general happiness of society. What does that mean? That if you desire to be wealthy, if you desire to be happy, then you should decrease your expenses and increase your income and do both of them at the same time and then do what? Yes, you're doing it for yourself, but you're also doing it for others. Because when you free yourself, guess what? You can be like Harriet Tubman and you go and free some more folks yourself. Yeah. Amen. God bless you. That is my time here today. Thank you so much for your attention. So today, I attended the Empowerment Summit. And boy, was I blessed. I'm empowered today to do better in my finances. It even had me to go back and look at my budget that I started years ago, that I found out today I really need to go back and stick with my budget. So I'm excited. And I have a $4,000 raise. So, so did y'all understand that? Yeah. So um, if, if I have a $1,000 credit card limit, I'm not spending more than $300 on that car, right? Now, how many, I, I heard them talk about parents that have children that's in college and they get those credit cards and it messes them up. Yeah, it messes them up because we don't train our children properly. Because we, we, we don't know. Kyle, pull your credit card out. Kyle's gonna pull his credit card out. He's gonna pull his credit card out. Show your credit card. Show the people your card. Now Kyle's been in college. He got the letters. Y'all see him, he's showing you American Express Gold card. Here's the deal. Kyle didn't apply for that card. His daddy has American Express. I added Kyle to the card. His credit is higher than mine. Are y'all understanding? And now I'm teaching him how to manage the car. Now because Kyle is more responsible with my money than his, 
but he is more responsible. He doesn't have a limit. But I have a daughter who has a card. Her limit is a thousand dollars a month. She's technically have to ask permission for anything over 300. She did not apply for the card. The card is in her father's name and she was added to the card. And I'm teaching her how to handle credit. Are y'all seeing this? What, and she's in college. She's not moved by credit card companies sending her um, credit cards. Why? Because she has a card. Y'all see that? It eliminates the temptation. My oldest boy, 26, I did the same for him, but I didn't give him the card. <laughs> I just added him to my car. He didn't even know. When he first started looking at his credit because he had to buy a home, he said, Dad, what's your credit score? And he started screenshotting me his 700 plus. My score is good. I said, I know, because I built it. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying to you? And so he was able to go and buy a home without any issues, without having, with paying the best interest rates. Why? Because we built his credit. I started when they were 18, 19. So are y'all understanding this? So this is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you get them to build their credit. Right? Now he's not looking to fill out a credit card. He has a card. And he, he has a power card. All I did was eliminate the temptation. Are y'all seeing this? Um, but asset protection is in relationship for this perspective, perspective we're dealing with insurance. Okay? So when we talk about asset protection, we're talking about insuring your assets. So you don't lose your assets. Because Simone, if you don't insure it, you'll lose it. I'm trying to tell you. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? And so, um, really what it means is a means of safeguarding what you have from potential risk. While insurance is commonly associated with providing financial compensation in the event of accidents, damages, or liabilities, it also plays a vital role in protecting those assets. I'll give you an example. How many homeowners I got in the room? Homeowners, homeowners. All right, we got to get more homeowners in the room. So, if you own a home, Ms. Sheila, and they have insurance. You got to pay your homeowner's insurance, right? That homeowner's insurance cover the building and it cover everything in the building, right? Unless you don't pay that insurance and insurance lapse. If you don't pay that insurance and insurance lapse, the mortgage company, because they, they care about the, the asset, the building, they do what's called a forced placed insurance. It costs almost double. Your mortgage payment goes up. Are y'all seeing this? And in addition to that, here's what else happens. In addition to that, if a fire hit, a storm come, the insurance only covers the house. Everything in it is gone. So you gotta pay attention. Are y'all understanding? Also, if you have homeowner's insurance and somebody break into your, your car and steal something out of your car or something like that, depending on the type of insurance you have, the reality is the homeowner's insurance covers the content. The car insurance covers the car. And so, well, what if I'm not a homeowner? Well, if you're a renter, the renter insurance covers content. Are y'all seeing this? Mm -hmm. And so, here we go. 10 most popular insurance policies. Health insurance, say health insurance. Health insurance. Life insurance, say life insurance. Life insurance. Auto insurance, say auto insurance. Gap insurance, say gap insurance. gap insurance. Homeowners or renters insurance, say it. Or Disability insurance, say it. Insurance. Dental insurance, say it. Insurance. Vision, insurance. Vision insurance. Personal property insurance. Personal property. Identity, the identity, theft identity theft protection. Now, I'm not going to go deep into any of those because we got somebody that can do that for us. But it's one that I must talk about. That next slide, I want y'all at the count of three, act like you're in a Baptist church or in a choir. And I want y'all to read the heading of that slide. The count of three, I want y'all to read that real loud. One, two, 
Three. Don't forget about GAP. All right. Now, who knows what GAP insurance is? I got one. I got two in a possible. Three, four. Okay. <clears throat> so I got less than 30% of this room actually knows what GAP insurance is. And that's the problem. But I'm about to give you the solution. So, how many of you ever had a car accident and unfortunately, the car totaled? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look at them hands. And when, and, but you still owed on the car. Well. <laughs> and so when it was time for you to get paid to recover your loss, they gave you a check that was significantly less than what you owed and was not enough to make you hold. Mm -hmm. Are y'all seeing this? So you become what's called upside down. Because when you buy a car, which is why uh, I never buy new cars. I'm cool with it. I don't buy new cars. I'm, I don't buy new cars. You drive off the lot 30%, lose 30%, well, 20% in depreciation, over 30% over five years. So that means when I buy a car for, let's say, $30,000, I drive off the lot, that car is really going to be worth about 20. Y'all see that? So if I drive off the lot and have a car accident, I owe 30, they give me a check for 20, I'm $10,000 upside down. I'm responsible for paying that $10,000 back. That's the gap between how much I owe and how much the car was worth. So they have this thing called gap insurance. So when you go and buy a car, they offer you gap. And if you don't get it, you're going to get it. <laughs> Y'all understanding what I'm saying? And so, and so, everybody forgets about gap because we go in with a poverty mindset, not how much is the car, not what is the interest rate. We go in with based on what we can afford per month. And because we didn't consider gap when we asked, when they asked us that question, we gave them our top. They maxed us out. So when they offered us gap for $20, $30, or $40 a month, we can't afford it because we already talk too much. Are y'all seeing this? Y'all y'all pray for my presentation. It used to be more polished until I just said, you know what, I'm gonna be me and they gonna learn more. Are y'all understand? So, so that's gap, right? So you cannot forget about that. My daughter, see, thank you. You, were, you was on a nurse's board, wasn't you? <laughs> My daughter, my daughter, my oldest daughter, um, she went and bought a car. And when she went and bought the car, um, she was telling me about the payments. And I said, baby, we don't buy cars based on payments. But dad, this is all I can afford it since you're not gonna, that's because baby, you already tore up, tore up three cars I done bought you, I'm done. Stick a fork in me, I'm done. I am out of the car ministry for you. <laughs> I'm done. I'm not doing it no more, right? And so, so somebody else did it. So they paid for it. I said, you got to get the gap insurance. Okay. But it's going to risk. Hey, you got to get the gap insurance. Because I can. The answer is no in advance. You got a track record. My baby drove off the lot. Week later, the car got totaled. I don't know what, that's the only kid I didn't teach how to drive. <laughs> All the rest of them I taught personally. <laughs> so, when she called, daddy, yeah. But it wasn't my fault though. And I believe you, I believe you, I believe you. I got one question. Did you get the gap insurance? She paused. Oh, you know that. oh no. <laughs> and she said, You know, at first I wasn't going to get it, but I got it. I said, Yes! <laughs> so don't forget about Gap. That's my story, y'all. Give it. <laughs>
Yes, I'm ready. Are y'all ready? How y'all feel? How y'all feel? All right, give it up for Miss Joanne Richard. God bless you. Thank you. It's a privilege and it's an honor. It's all due to the glory of God. But I do want to say, take advantage and use the opportunity today because when I was here almost 10 years ago, I came, I didn't know anybody at the church. I just heard about the empowerment workshop and showed up because I was always interested in helping people. And I have a passion, especially, I'm going to be speaking of insurance today. I want to give my testimony. You could move to the next slide, young man. Now, this is something that I'm really passionate about because about 13 years ago, I was suddenly widowed. I had a son who had just gone to Bible college, and my daughter was in her last year of high school. And my husband collapsed in the Starbucks in Homewood, and that was the end for him. I, we got a call. And the next day he was declared brain dead and passed away, only three years from retiring after 34 years with the post office. Wow. My husband was uninsurable due to his health, but by the grace of God, when we started off the marriage, we did get insurance and everything in place, so I didn't lose anything. I was able to continue my standard of living all to the testament of God. But had I said it in the workshop previously that I set in when I came here 10 years ago, I would have had a lot more insurance. So this is something that's so important. And it was at the workshop then that I learned how you purchase insurance. You know, how do you determine how much coverage you, you need? Many years ago, our community was never taught to purchase insurance. So I'm going to first talk about the purpose of insurance. The purpose of insurance, and I don't have it on there, but I can share because I'm talking about what I live. So the purpose of insurance is to, for income protection, to protect the income that you have. We think about protecting everything else, our cars, our home, everything, but we never think about protecting our income. We've never been taught that. Okay, so in protecting your income is real important because we never know when a life might end early. So you wanna be able to, it's to replace the income that you have so that that money will still come in in the event of an early death. You will be able to continue on. Everybody follow that. Okay, so that's very, very important. Okay, so um, with the, uh, I'm gonna talk about a few things concerning uh, insurance. Now with the insurance, when you purchase life insurance, you create an immediate state. What do I mean by that? An estate is nothing but assets that you have. So if you go out and you purchase a three, four, five hundred thousand dollars insurance, that's an estate that you, it's immediate. Insurance is some of the cheapest money that you can buy when you look at what it costs. I want to deviate real quickly before I go on to tell a, a brief story that I learned from someone in my office called the story of the Indians. Had you ever wondered why a lot of Indians that are here own all the gas stations, they own hotels, they own Dunkin' Donuts? You ever thought about that? You know, I had been thinking about that one day. How do they own all of this and how do they, you know, just buy this stuff and have it? And shortly after that, I went to a session called Women and Wine to educate women in the area of finance. And the lady was sharing a true story. She's in my business, the company I'm with of how she got started in business and she moved to Chicago and she didn't know anybody so she just went out to businesses talking. So she went in the 7-Eleven where Indians owned it and she said to them, she wanted to talk to them about purchasing insurance and they said to her, well, uh, we already have insurance and she said, well, when was the last time you had somebody look at your insurance? And uh, uh, they said, well, we were just talking about that. So they made a call and they said to her, can you come to our home on Sunday? So that Sunday she went to the home and she said when she got there, it was about 14 family members and they were all sitting down eating. They start asking her a lot of questions to see what she knew about insurance. And then they said, okay, well let, let us tell you how we buy insurance. True story. They said, we put a million dollars on our oldest family member. We all pay the premium. So those 14 people all pay the premium. When that person died, we take half of that money, $500,000. We buy a hotel, we buy a gas station, we buy a Dunkin' Donuts, then we take some money and we buy visas and we send across the water for some of our relatives to come here because we already got jobs for them when they get here. And the rest of the money we put on the next family member and then we distribute what's left. Wow. So what they figured out is how to use insurance where a lot of times Americans haven't. 
Remember, it's some of the cheapest money that you can buy, so what the insurance costs, we got to start thinking that way. Since I've been in the business, I'm telling you, it's something when a family member passes and you can take that family a check for three, four, five hundred thousand dollars instead of people just thinking about burial. And still you can't convince anybody. I've gone to talk to families where they just wanted to buy 10,000. 15,000, 25,000, didn't want to provide the money they need to carry on a legacy. A lot of our families are going from broke generation to broke generation, as Pastor Dan said. But we have the opportunity, because of the education and applying the education that we're learning here today, to do better. So my mother used to say, when you know better, you should do better, okay? So that's what we want to do. But I had to share that because that, that, that really hit me. You know, just knowing how, how are they doing some of this, we have the same opportunity before us. Plan A, Plan B, this is vitally important about buying the right type of insurance. Now Plan A, I want you to just listen to this and I'll take a vote in the end. Plan A keeps, your, keeps all your money the first two to five years. It pays you a one to four percent interest rate, six to eight percent interest rate to borrow your money, and it keeps the return on your money if you die. So it's going to keep the money in the policy if you die. It'll pay you the face value, but it's going to keep the money in the policy. Plan B, money is credited to you immediately, seven percent and up potential return on your money, no fees or questions to withdraw your money, and a family gets cash if you die. How many of you would like a policy with plan A? Raise your hand if you do. How many want a policy with plan B? Plan B is term life insurance. It's pure insurance coverage. And so the company that I'm with, we only sell uh, term life insurance because the cost is low and with that money you're able to afford more coverage. A lot of times when you're starting off, you just want to get the coverage in place, then you get as much as you can afford and term is a lot less expensive than the, uh, than the whole life insurance. So two things I want to talk about. Number one, how many people have uh, life insurance on your job? How many only have life insurance on your job? Okay, life insurance on your job, you need to be sure that you have your own individual coverage. Why? If you leave the job, you have no coverage. Okay, number one. Number two, when you have a life insurance on your job, many times in the event of the death, you don't have a policy, you don't have any paperwork, your family doesn't have any paperwork, so you need your individual coverage. Another thing is as we age, hereditary conditions kick in. You need to purchase insurance as early as you can because a lot of times things that may go on in our family don't show up when we're younger. It starts to show up earlier. Another thing, the later you wait to buy insurance, the more expensive it is. So, you know, you're not able to afford that much. You wouldn't be able to afford that million. You know, you wouldn't be able to afford the amount of money that you really need to pass on the legacy. So that's, that's uh, two reasons for that. So you want to be sure that you have your own individual policy if you have insurance on your job and you are nearing retirement, you need to be sure that when you retire, that policy stays the same. Many people on government jobs might have insurance. That insurance might be one, 200,000. When they get ready to retire, in many cases, it'll reduce all the way down to $5,000, mm -hmm. all the way down to $10,000. And people don't know because who tells you this? Nobody except somebody like us at this workshop. So that's very, very important to know with that. And so any questions about the, and there's, I'm not gonna go into all the different types of insurance policy. Maybe if we have, like he talked about future webinars, we'll talk about that because there's really only term and then a variation of term, whether they call it universal, whether they call it index universal life, uh, return of, they're changing all the names. So there's really only those two. Any questions before we go? I have a question because mm -hmm. I have policies on my kids. So okay, my when I open, when I started the policy, one my daughter was under the age I think of eighteen, and so they automatically put her on the whole life. Okay. And so they're saying, okay, so you're you're you know you're getting some money, you're building up money, okay, so that you know eventually you could borrow from that or whatever if you needed to. But with my son, he was older, so they automatically put him on term. Okay. So I was trying to figure out, like she was saying, that when he turns 25, I should change it to whole life. So mm -hmm. I'm like, try, now when you said that, I'm mm -hmm. like, 
do I switch her to term now or? Well, I'll say again, term is just pure insurance cash value. If you remember that chart, when you pass away and you have cash value in that policy, it goes back to the insurance company. You don't get it. All you're going to get is the face value. You could have bought term for just the face value. A real important notice, if you have whole life, do not leave here today and cancel your insurance. You never cancel any insurance, you never make any changes until you put another policy in place to be sure that you are insurable. Okay, so you know, be educated if you need to make changes, you know, maybe sit down, talk, make appointments and stuff, but I'm just telling you what's the, the, the insurance. And also, there are some situations, I've talked to people, I've done workshops at different places where somebody wanted insurance and they were uninsurable. In that case, people have to get whatever they can get. If you're uninsurable, you might have to, when I say uninsurable, do you know what I mean by that? Yes. Yeah, health-wise, some health people might not qualify. So sometimes you may have to try to go with a group insurance, associations. If you could get a whole life, you might have to just get a burial policy. I work with a company where we do term, but there's some cases where people can't qualify. I work with another company who will insure almost anybody. There are three questions that they ask, okay. Did you oh, have yeah. a quick what, question? Um, what is a good term, like the length of years? To well, I'll tell you, even before I got into the insurance industry, even before my husband passed, I learned this area of money, it was just something I was interested in for many, many years. And I can remember a church member selling me a New York Life policy and Money Magazine put out a two-part series about why you want to buy term insurance. I was in my 20s when I read that article. When I read that article, I canceled that whole life and I never bought whole life again. I only purchased term and I only buy what's called level term. Level term, the only policies I purchased go for 30 years and the premium never changed. Now the state farms in all states of the world, they were late to the party. They're offering it now, but they didn't offer insurance like that because the level term, like for those of you that had children, my children, well they're in their 30s, but when I purchased insurance for them, when they became adults, I only purchased 35 year term insurance where they rate us the same. Okay, here's another thing. I know they try to get you to purchase insurance on children and it's good, you know, when you get a, with a good company, they'll usually always provide a rider in case something happened to your kids, but a lot of companies, try, kids don't really produce the income, so you want to cover them in the event of burial, but don't let them trick you into trying to get large policies on kids when they're minors. Now once they become up, you do need to get that money because you start getting it early and they're all set, do you know what I mean? Financially, if you're able to get a good policy on them. So I'm going to take this last question and I'll move on to the investments. Um, are life insurance policies transferable? So like if um, your parent gets you a life insurance when you're a minor and then you're an adult, can you take on that life insurance? I have heard of some instances, but really once that happened, usually that policy goes to the child. Okay. Usually, yeah, right. Not. Right, exactly. Oh. Two more important things that I never heard before I got into the industry, I never heard people talk about. When you purchase a policy, there's, we all know that there's a beneficiary, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you also know that there's an owner? Do you know what that means, the owner? Yeah. The owner of a policy is the person who actually controls that policy. I'm going to tell you why this is important. In my family, I had a, a, there was two people in my family that they got a divorce and one of the, did the mic go off? Yeah, it went. Oh, okay, but you can still hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, one of the family members wanted to keep the life insurance policy. Well, the other, the spouse that they were getting the divorce, divorce from didn't want to keep it. So, okay, so it ended up being canceled, right? So usually the person when you're setting up the policy, like let's say you're the wife and you want that policy in place no matter what happened, then you could request to be the owner. So you would have to say so even if somebody's paying the premium. Does that, do you guys understand that? Right, so that's real important. It's a lot of things we don't know because they don't educate us on. That's how it is when yeah. Said, like my I'm sorry. That's how it is when she mentioned about when you're a kid and yes. then you become an adult. Right. So that's how they have me now as the owner of Great. the kid's policy. Okay. They're 33 and 30, but I got good. They were 10 and okay. 13. And that's good because let's say your daughter marries somebody and he say, oh, we don't need that insurance and they try to cancel, they're going to notify you because you're the owner. Now there's many different kind of investments, but I'm going to be talking about investments and in mutual funds today. Okay, so um, the strategy, can you move to the next screen for me, please? 
Okay, now earlier today we heard Social Security mentioned. Now this right here, even though we're all different ages in this room, and there's young to older, even including myself, the strategy really doesn't change. The earlier you can start building money for retirement, the better, because we, you are going to get older as you live, and I'm gonna tell you, the years go by really, really fast, okay? The younger you can start, the, the time is on your side, because if you start saving, and I think Pastor Dan might cover this, if you started saving right now and save $6,000 from the age of, let's say, 20 to 29 and stop, and never save again, a person who starts 30 and go all the way to 60 will never accumulate as much money because time is money. And so I'll demonstrate that, but the strategy is basically this. If you can look at that, that's really like a stool. See where it says retirement save strategies? That's what retirement used to look like. You could sit on a three-legged stool. Well, today it's looking more like a one-legged stool, though some people are living only off Social Security. Okay, so all of us in this room have the opportunity to make a change because I say it's never too late to start. So where you see the personal plans, whether you're saving in a 401k, and it doesn't make any difference if you haven't started because that's what this is about today. So whether you're saving in a 401k, a mutual fund, a savings account, CD, money market, IRA, those are monies that you need to build up on your own. If, you, if Social Security does go away some years from now and they keep moving it back, then you can build up sizable assets and you can create a pension-like product for yourself known as an annuity, where you get a monthly payout and depending on how the annuity is set up, it'll pay you for the rest of your life, as long as you live. So that's why you wanna start accumulating and saving assets for yourself. So that is what the strategy is to start wherever you are. Once you have established the emergency fund that we're talking about, then from there you again start saving for the long term. Even if you can only start off, no amount is too small. If it could be $25, $50, I have access to many companies and I can set people up in mutual funds for as low is $25 a month, okay? You couldn't go to those same companies, but I can do it for you, okay? Okay, so this is the rule of 72. One thing, all I want you to remember about this rule right here is when you hear the rule of 72, anybody ever heard of this rule? No. Nobody? Okay, this rule is gonna tell you one thing. I, I saw your hand, thank you. It's gonna tell you how quickly your money can double. So if you go into the bank, or let's say you, have an, you go into the bank and you're gonna put your CD in a, your money in the CD and it's gonna pay you 3%, it's gonna take you 24 years for that money to double. Let's say you kept putting it in the CD. But if you were in the same bank and they said, okay, I'm gonna pay you 12%. You take the 12%, divide it into 72. That's what it's about. And that means every six years that money's gonna double. So it's important to know that because the higher amount you could get. You know, you don't want to make it real risky. Then the faster your money grows. So look at that last column where it's 12%. That 10,000 in six years grew to 20, then to 40, then to 60. If you look at the end in 48 years, somebody who just started with $10,000 that yielded 12% a year, at the end, it was $2,560,000. Now, this is why the bank is in business. You know, there's people who have had their money in the bank for more than, for this long, over a lifetime. And so that money grew, but at the end, if the bank only paid them 3%, they only got 40,000, so the bank ended up with 2,500 and $2,520,000. Does it make you sick? I'm looking at your face, Reva. <laughs> Just thinking about this, so we wanna get smarter by getting educated and then applying the knowledge. But does everybody understand this? So the rule of 72 tells you one thing, how quick it takes your money to double, okay? That doesn't mean that if somebody offer you 15% for an investment and you know there's nothing out here, 15% that's safe, you take that. We gotta use wisdom. Okay, so one thing, you wanna always pay yourself first. Uh, the rule of thumb, if you can, is to save your 10%. If you're a believer, you want to tithe first. Don't be trying to do this without giving God his portion because all we have belongs to him. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so you're going to pay, you're going to do that as if you were holding yourself a bill. 
you know, you're going to pay yourself after your tie. Okay, and sudden, so we'll talk about the three accounts. I'm going to come back and talk about those a little bit quicker, but everybody should have this, I call it the three buckets of three accounts. The first is the emergency fund, where you build up emergency fund. Typically, you want your gold, especially today, because we're living in such a volatile time, you would like to build it up to one to three months of of income because a lot of look what happened in COVID and sometimes when people lose a job they can't find another one as quickly so you want to build that up to cover your emergencies now we say emergencies it's not going out to buy something that you see that's impulsive or compulsive that he talked about that you want to buy and then the short term would be eventually we know if we're driving a car we'll have to replace our cars right is that true yeah. okay so we want to have money like that if you eventually want to buy a home you know and you're not a homeowner that's where you want your money to be for that too or in case there's a medical situation comes up where you have an illness or a medical bill that's where you want to hold that money is in the short-term account and then after you have those set we go on to the wealth building account uh, how many have ever heard of a mutual fund okay great i had the opportunity my second job out of college i actually worked for a mutual fund long i wasn't invested in it because i didn't know anything about it all state used to have a mutual fund all state stock mutual fund it's been gone for a long time now but let's say here that you had a hundred dollars and you went out tell me if you so you had a hundred dollars and you went out and you purchased home depot stock and the stock, can you see this? Okay, and the stock dropped down in value. You would have to wait for the stock to come back up, right? To get your money. And if it went out of business, you wouldn't get any money, right? So you would, you would not have any money. So a mutual fund is an account where generally it's more than 100 companies involved in the mutual fund. So let's say you put that same $100 in a mutual fund. And I'm just gonna draw this to represent just some of the companies. So let's say we got Coca-Cola, we have Walmart in here, we have Target here, we have AT&T here. You get the point, we got Apple in here. So let's say each company in here is representing a dollar, right? And we got Home Depot in here. Now, if Home Depot went out of business and the stock was a dollar, do you think it would affect you in the mutual fund where they have a lot of stocks? No, it's not gonna affect you as much because at the same time that Home Depot or any other company went out of business, then Coca-Cola may go up in value, so you're not gonna feel it, okay? So now with the mutual fund, there's this guy here with some heavy glasses or thick glasses, I'll say. This is the mutual fund manager. Okay, I'm not that guy. I don't do his job. His job is to manage, you know, what uh, stocks they buy and sell. If he decided he didn't like AT&T, T &T, he could sell AT&T and he could buy Verizon. Okay, so that's the job of the mutual fund. Now, but you want to have a mutual fund because it provides three things. Number one, it provides what's called diversification. Now, you could probably finish this statement, don't put all your eggs in what? One basket. One basket, okay. Right, so with the mutual fund, it provides an opportunity for you to diversify or have your money all split up in different baskets. Number two is this guy right here. He provides professional management for you. And number three is it's liquid. Now we're not talking about if it's your 401k, but if it's a fund you're investing in with after-tax dollars, we love real estate, we know it generates money, but with the mutual fund, you could probably have your money out within two to five days, have it right back in your bank account. So that's what this provides. But you might be saying to yourself, can I lose my money in this mutual fund? Well, the only way you could lose your money in the mutual fund is that if all these companies went out of business at the same time. Why is that? Because we shop at Target, Walmart, we buy food, we buy clothes, we buy technology equipments, we buy uh, automobiles and tires and all those kind of things. And our money is going to fund these companies even though the value of those companies might go up and down. Is that true? Right. So, uh, so our job, what we want to do, so it funds that so you know that this is going to always be around. So now, there is a difference between loss 
and risk. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate that for you now. So I'm going to erase this. And what I'm going to say is, is going to seem real simplistic, but just stick with me for a minute. Let's say that you are a farmer and you have 20 acres of land and you need to buy cows and you only have $100 a month to buy a cow, okay? So the first month, cows are going for $100 and you only have $100, how many cows can you buy that first month? One cow, okay. And then the second month, cows drop to $50. How many can you get? Okay, and the third month, cows drop to $25. Four. Okay, and then the next month, they go back up to 50. So how many? <laughs> Okay, and finally, you're laughing, but this is going to be a good ending. And finally, they go back up to 100, okay, and so you get one cow. So that gives you 10 cows, right? So you spent $500, and you have 10 cows by 100, and that's $1,000. So your investment kind of doubled. Okay, now let me show you some. Now we know those are cows, but let's say I'm gonna draw a chart now, and I want you, instead of thinking about cows, I want you to think about shares, okay? So up here is gonna be 100. This is gonna be 50. This is gonna be 25. And I'm gonna draw for the five, okay? So for the first month, we know we were way up there. Then. We bought two at 50, then it went down here. We got four, you follow me? For the 25, then it went back up, okay? Okay, so this is what the stock market looks like sometimes. It goes up and down, would you agree? Okay, so now let me ask you, even though there was volatility in the market, you were able to double your money without the, without the fund even doubling money. Do you like that idea? What if you could do that with your own money? Would you be excited about that? Okay, so now, I can't tell you when to buy or sell. I don't know, but this guy does. That's his job, that's what he does. But what we do is we, I find clients and we consistently invest money in the market so that we can capture the ups and downs on the market. Now that doesn't give you a guarantee, but it does create the possibility of you being able to take advantage of the lows in the market. Right? So that's real, real important. So that's how we get started. So let me ask you, if you're in here for the long term and you want to build money for the long term, do you want the market to be up or down? Yeah. Down, okay. So this is real important because I bet you, how many of you got some investment accounts or even at your job and you look at the statement, so next time you look at your statement, if the statement is down, don't get panicked just for that quarter. I don't care what the news is going to tell you. You know, the news will say, oh, you just lost half of your, your retirement plan. You haven't lost anything if you didn't sell it, okay? So don't pay attention to that. So next time you see that, just know that the money is made in the ups and downs of the market, okay? Because wealth is a mindset. Poverty is not the lack of money. Poverty is having the wrong mindset. So us as people, our job is that we want to educate our people, I want to educate my clients to have the right mindset. Because with that mindset, it will enable us to continue to pay ourselves first, and then pay first, and then dollar cost average now. Who's familiar with that term, dollar cost average? Anybody? That's what we did with the cows. Dollar cost average just means if you say, I'm gonna set up a mutual fund with you, Joanne, and I'm gonna put $50 in there every month, that you're gonna put that $50 in there every month no matter what. Because sometimes when you buy, the stock might be, you might be buying a stock, it might be $50 this month, 60 next month, 20 the next month, you get that? You just wanna stay the road because I'm telling you, I have a, the next, I have a chart that's gonna show you how over time, no matter what was going on in the economy, investments continue to grow. So did, you, did this make it clear for you? Yes. As far as, I like to show this because it's different when you just see a stock chart on that investment things. I like to really show you how the market works. Okay. And this just talks about with the mutual fund, you make money with um, 
capital gains. Capital gains mean if the mutual fund bought Apple for $90 and it went up to $190, the $100 is capital gain. And then you also make money by dividends. You know, if they have a good season, you know, a good, good quarter or something, they'll throw back some money into the mutual fund, uh, which will also help your account value go up as well. Okay, and then appreciation. You're usually gonna rep, you're usually going to see appreciation if they sell. If you're not selling, you're not. You know it'll go up on paper. Okay, so now you might not be able to see this, but I could give you an idea of what this is about. This is talking about investing with your head and not the headlines. And this goes back about 20 years, and it talks about all the different things that were going on. This was just a $10,000 investment, which averaged over 8.9 over the years, and how the, uh, the portfolio went up like more than $200,000, $300,000. So don't, don't pay attention. I have another uh, brochure by one of them. I have a lot of companies that I have access to that is spread all the way across and they tell you everything that's happened in the economy. And in the meantime, the money invested, the people left invested, just kept increasing and increasing. Not to say that it didn't drop now, because if you're looking, if you can see this, you may not be able to see the numbers because it's too far away, but you see where those reds are? That's when the market was down because I, I have another chart out of like the last um, 60 something years, well, 69 years of going back in the market. So many years were positive and about 19 years were negative. So there's going to be ups and downs. In 2008, we all know that everything dropped, right? Real estate, everything. So just know staying the course is what makes the difference. Okay, life insurance um, is a powerful tool. We already talked about that, how it gives you the opportunity. It really gives you the opportunity to change life for generations to come. If you can leave money instead of all in money. I was just involved in a real sad situation a month ago where a family member died and there was so much strife. You know, there was really no money left. It was just enough to have him cremated. But guys, we got to get our business together as people. We got to, we just got to get it done. We can't put it off like when he talked about the gap insurance with his daughter, get it done today. You know, uh, also, let me go back real quick. If you're offered life insurance on your job, don't pass it up, take it. Because that's more money, but just be sure that you have your own. But that's our opportunity to change life for generations to come. And, and we leave, you were able to leave an inheritance because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a good man or a good woman leaves an inheritance to his children, right? That's like a commandment for us. I'll just point you to the page and you can figure that out later. Because that's the key. What is that? Yeah, that is the real key. And I'm telling you, when I came here, 46. 46, okay. Yeah, but I, yeah, right there. Because they, I mean, you want to, you, you, you can maybe can only afford it, but start off wherever you can. But see, this gives us an opportunity so that we're able to leave that inheritance. So it talks about the annual income, in this case, was $80,000. Um, and then they, what, in this example, he was using an idea that a family, maybe they had a child or something, people depended on them, they were going to need to depend on them for 15 more years. And so that's why they used the 15, so their income was $80,000. Remember, the purpose of life insurance is to replace the income. You should be able to have enough money that you take that money upon the death of somebody and invest it, and then the investment is going to generate that $80,000 back to you. Does everybody follow that? That's what the purpose is. And so the total income needed over the support period was $1,200,000. Then they, they had some savings, so deducted that. But then you can also add in if you have mortgages, if you have credit card debt, add that in so that upon the death you would have everything taken care of. So be sure that if you're trying to figure out how much you can go back and get that done on 46. That, that, made a, that had a big impact on me when I came to that when I came to the workshop that he gave, that I had never ever seen that before, even though I had been in financial circles. So it helped me. You know, my uh, children are in their 30s now. I had kids late. They're in their 30s now. But if I would have, if I would have passed tomorrow, they would be okay. I'm telling you, for pennies on the dollar. I'm yeah. telling you, they would be okay. And I have it set up. You got to think. Have your papers. I have in my case it's set up so that if something would have happened to me. My, my daughter is my son's beneficiary and he's hers and I got strict instructions, you know, with that. So start thinking about what you can do now. The earlier you can start, then it doesn't take as much money. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. 
I saw a commercial about term life insurance mm -hmm. where if the insurance, you finish the term and you're still alive, mm -hmm. you get the money back. That you invested in. Yeah, that's retirement premium. Yeah, there's all kind of gimmicks if you ever miss a payment and all these things, then that's all null and void. They're doing everything they can to get the money, and usually that's whole life, but the one you saw said term. Okay, yeah, they have all kind of things, but there is all kind of fine print in there. Return, right. So people usually don't get it back. Well, there's something that well there's all kind of things that happen because we, even though we plan for things to happen a certain way, it's all kind of things that could happen. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, so be aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so wealth generation, the desire of every parent and every family is for your children to be left better than you were. Is that the desire for each one of you all? Right here, right here. So I believe that I'm, I'm finishing up that in order to pass along generational wealth, then we need to start putting things in place today. We, if you have young, young, you know, like he talked about the, I love how he did the credit cards with his kids. You, we have got to educate, educate the, the youth. I have a, a niece that just graduated from college and got a job making $90,000 a year. And somebody tried to sell her a life insurance policy for $600 a month. And the first thing she did was call me on the phone and I said, have the person get on the phone with me. They weren't gonna do that. She didn't do it, she knew better. But we have an obligation to train our youth, you know, so that they can do better and so that they can be educated. And next time Pastor Dan has something like this, if you have young people, get them out, you know, so they can learn from that. Okay, and then this just talks about risk tolerance. When you're ready to start your mutual fund, everybody that's gonna be invested, we always figure out what the risk tolerance is. What does that mean? Well, Breva, maybe, maybe, maybe you couldn't stand to lose a dollar in an investment. Maybe that would make you nervous and you couldn't sleep at night. Whereas this young man might say, well, you know, if I could get more money, I wanna be high risk because I'm not gonna you know, retire for so many years, so I don't care. I wanna be in more aggressive funds. So we're gonna take a survey and assess to determine what your risk tolerance is. If it's, you know, if it's average, if it's above average, you know, if you're real conservative and you wanna maybe be in a mutual fund investment that doesn't pay as much, but that can gain you money over time. So that's automatically something that we do. And creating a savings plan. So you wanna, uh, this is like that GPS. Pastor Dan kept on saying, if you don't know where you're going, you end up anywhere. So I call it a, a GPS. Now, one thing I found, I used to assist in the teaching of, of Dave Ramsey classes at the church I used to go to. And the thing with that class, and I don't know if you could relate to this, Pastor Dan, is that a lot of the people didn't get the benefits that they could out of class because their financial stuff was all over. They couldn't get their paperwork together. You got to sit down today. It was great how people determined how much they were overspending or spending on things they didn't need. You got to sit down today, figure out, it can start with that net worth, looking at your assets, even if the net worth is negative. It can start with that. You sit down and figure out how much you owe, you know, uh, how much you own, find out do you have investments where you work for a company and maybe you had an investment plan there and forgot all about it. Is money somewhere for you? Go on, they used to call it cash dash. I don't know what it is today. Go on there, see if it's any, you guys know what I'm talking about? People go out there and find money. It's a government website yeah. uh, for the state. And uh, you could go on there and a lot of times there's money out there for you that you never knew was there. Maybe you had an account somewhere or maybe somebody owed you some money. I don't know, the, can somebody else help me out with this? official name of it. I tell Pastor Dan. Yeah, yeah, you could just go for unclaimed money in Illinois, right, on Google, and they'll tell you. And it's free. You don't have to pay. You just, because after my husband passed, actually, he had some stock at a company many years ago. And so I had to produce the, the uh, appropriate uh, documents and they, they gave me the money, right? But why is that important? Because we talked about increasing your income and decreasing your expenses. So you might have money out there that you don't know about, okay? So you want to get your plan in place, you know, uh, choosing the right, you know, starting your emergency fund, assets and your expenses, choosing the right, track and monitor your progress and stay disciplined. And uh, as he was doing that exercise today, I was telling the young man that was sitting next to me, I've been doing this for a long time, I track every penny I spend every month. I write down everything. 
Okay. That's, you know a lot of people won't do that, but that's important because a lot of times the average person, if you tell them how much they ask them how much they make, they might not really figure out how much they bring home and if you ask them how much they spend, a lot of times they can't tell you because they're not tracking everything. Small cap stocks, that's just companies that's just starting off. Now what's the difference when you're a small cap or a mid cap stock? They can probably give a greater return, you know, because they're just starting off, you know, and they, they, uh, they are trying to find their way up so they can, it's a little bit riskier. Than the, uh, than the mega companies like the Walmarts and the Apples and the Googles. So uh, these companies right here can give a little bit more of a return because it's a little bit more risky. They haven't really established themselves so much. And then emerging markets, uh, they're called the BRICS nation, Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, India, it's several of them. Those are the emerging market. Those are also risky, but the, you learn about these when you get ready to do an investment. Okay, and then the uh, ETFs he asks about, which is good, the ETFs, okay, and then venture capital and private equity and small businesses. So these are all good avenues for investments. All right, thank you so much. I enjoyed the opportunity to come and share. God bless you. I did. I got a raise for around $8,000. Looking at my finances and just going through it for the last, like, 90 days, I realized how much I spend and impulsively spend at that and not think about or budget for it so it really showed me exactly what is being spent from a month-to-month -month basis and it's showing me that I can save over eight thousand dollars within the, the last 90 days I would re definitely recommend the empower to prosperity boot camp to so all who are really wanting to learn financial literacy who want to be educated on how to better manage their finances and and be better with spending and saving because it's very important especially in this time where everything is going up we need to be able to budget our money and make sure we secure a better future for ourselves and you invest in real estate and you're able to get a 20 30 40 percent return on your investment within 12 to 18 months you are doing extremely well but do y'all understand that and so when, when we talk about insurance, when we talk about um, life insurance, I need everybody. I have your email addresses. I need you to go through that workbook on page 46. Normally, if we had more time, we will stop and we would do it right now. You will figure it out right now because I want you to leave knowing how much life insurance you need in order to, to continue where you want to be, right? We don't have that type of time, so I want you to do it at home. I'm sending an email. I got all your email addresses. I'm sending an email and I'm going to ask, is it done? And then if it's not done and if you need help, you guys have my email address. Say, hey, we need to set up some level of consultation because, listen, one thing um, that's guaranteed, there's going to be a time to be born and it's going to be a time to die. And, and the cheapest way to begin to leave an inheritance for your children's children is through a life insurance policy. Are y'all hearing me? That's, that's the cheapest way. Now, when I die, I'm not, they not getting it all at once. I'm, no, they don't know no better. I, I don't know that they listen. I don't know if Kyle paying attention in this session. I'm not gonna give it all to them. But what you do is you take, I got it set up, well if I die, there's a, the principal is going to be invested. That's going to yield somewhere around 8 to 10% on an annual basis. That's going to pay out how they live. So they get paid off the interest. And the principal is going to stay where it is. Because now I just started generational wealth. Are y'all seeing what's happening? This is a million dollars, eight to ten percent over a million dollars annually. That's eighty to hundred thousand dollars. No, you're still going to work, <laughs> but you're going to be straight. All bills paid off. That's what's the purpose of this. We could break the cycle of poverty just by getting a life insurance policy. Allstate paid me $25,000 to teach biblical principles of life insurance. I spoke in 30 churches over a 45-day period.
teaching biblical principles of life insurance. 70% of the churches of those individuals are either uninsured or underinsured, including the pastor. We show drive good. We show look good. Are y'all understanding? Some of us look good. I mean, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> but seriously, and I, I'm stopping here because I want us to really get that. There's another one that she talked about that we didn't fill out is your net worth. I need you to put it in. I need to understand. I want you to see it. I want you to see it grow. Did you show the slide, Ms. Joanne, that said, if you start investing at this age, so let me tell y'all this. I thought I talked about it, that if, they, if a 20-year-old started saving $6,000, yeah. if he was 29 and stopped and somebody else started, they would never, ever catch up. And, the, and that 6000 would grow to like over a million. 2.2 million by retirement age. There's a cost to waiting, though. Every year you wait, more money you lose in the tens of thousands of dollars. So I don't care where you are, start today. Yes. I, I was sitting in my office and I heard, this, uh, I heard this quote. And the quote came, I believe, from the Lord. I was having a Nicole moment. Nicole hears from God all the time. <clears throat> and I was having a Nicole moment. I was hearing from God. And it said, y'all know it says, render Caesar what's due Caesar. And I, I wrote down, Give Caesar what's due him, but don't give him any more. Giving Caesar what's due him is understanding the law and taking care of your business as it pertains to tax returns and all of that stuff. Pay your taxes. But don't pay more than you have to. Don't pay more than Caesar requires. And we pay more than Caesar requires because of ignorance. Because my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So we don't understand tax codes. So we go to H and I block them. We go turbo tax fast. Instead of getting a CPA and account, and I'm not knocking H for anybody that does it, I'm not knocking it, I'm just learning that when, when my money started increasing, I understood the level of consultation had to increase as well. Are, are y'all understanding what I'm saying? So, so when, with taxes, there's a lot of tax shelters. And that's what Joanne can help you with. How, when you invest money in real estate and we sell a real, piece of real estate property, we have a certain amount of time to take that, that profit and invest it, that capital gain, to avoid capital gain tax. You take that and you invest it in another property and you keep doing it and you're never paying capital gains tax. By the time I'm 100, okay, I'm gone. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put it in a state. Are y'all understanding what I'm telling you? But you, the law only benefits those that know. We talked about increase in income. Increase in income from home creates a what? Home-based business. Now, I'm talking about taxes. I'm just not going through the book. It's a home-based business, right? So now you increase in income. You got a home-based business. There's a percentage of, of your living arrangements that pays rent now to your home. There's over 300 tax deductions that the small business owner have to minimize their tax liability legally. Are y'all seeing this? Why is this stuff important? Because we're paying more than we have to because we just don't know. We just don't know. And I don't want to die. You know, everybody say, I got good friends of mine that are older and they say when they die they want to die empty yep. and yeah what that means they want to give out everything they got yeah. mm -hmm. they, they, all of the knowledge and I got that because that's me y'all I don't want to have gone through all the hell I went through and not help somebody else not go through it mm -hmm. when I die I want to die empty 
But the Negroes that I leave behind, I want to leave behind full. Are y'all seeing this? Full of information, full of education, full of education, full of resources. Full. I tell my son all the time, I want everything I got in me to be in you. And then when you take everything that's in you, you're going to be ten times better than me. Yeah. Are y'all seeing it? He'll tell you, I tell him that all the time. And, and I tell him he's a, already a better man than me. He has patience. I never prayed for it because I didn't want it. <laughs> he'd be like, Dad, I got it. Because he, he's... Can, can, I, I, y'all understand what I'm saying though? And so this is what this was all about. Empowered to Prosperity. Um, boot camp. It is a boot camp. You notice we kept going. If you needed to take a break, take a break. If you didn't need to take a break. And even for those of you that, did, that, didn't, that didn't go to bed last night and you got a little sleepy, it wasn't because we was boring. It was because you didn't get no rest. We spoke to your spirit. In Jesus' name. And we believe the seed that we sow was going to be a harvest. I need y'all to do a couple of things for me. Uh, was this all right? Yeah. How y'all doing? Yeah. Come on. How y'all doing? Hey, good afternoon. This Empowerment to Prosper Boot Camp was amazing. Uh, awesome information, cutting edge information. Uh, a lot of things that we thought that we knew uh, gave us some more insight on them to prepare for our financial future. Uh, future. Uh, what really impacted my life the most was just the information about the life insurance, the investments, uh, the credit repair, just, just cutting edge information that really helped us to now we gotta go home and, and uh, sit down and go back to the drawing board to help us to grow into the future. And so I want to recommend this class. I want to recommend you, your family, your children as well, to be able to come into this, this wonderful uh, event in the future. And it's going to be amazing for your family, for your prosperity, and for your growth. Hey everybody, I enjoyed today's financial class. Uh, change your world today, baby. My world was changed today. And I know one person gonna benefit is my husband because he'll be like, man, you got some money. Now I got some money. Cause guess what? Fashion Nova gonna hit, they gonna be mad. Chick me gonna be mad. Facebook and all them people I've been buying, you know, stuff from, they're gonna be mad. But one thing I learned is about prioritiz prioritization and elimination. So I'm gonna eliminate a lot of stuff. I have to prioritize. And I gotta finally make a budget. I didn't have a budget, y'all. So, Michi is gonna have a budget. Michi got some money. And then when I finish writing this book, I'll know how to be a great steward over the finances that I will earn from this book that I can bless others in the meantime. Amen. So thank you, Pastor Dan. This was so off the chain. Y'all get it? Come to the next one. Please, please. And I I think I got like a $30,000 raise or something. Y'all, this is about to be on and popping. All right. Thank y'all. Yeah, I've been evicted. Yeah, I had to. I also went to the payday loan place at one time. Mm -hmm. And I parked a block away. Because I didn't want nobody to see me coming, going to the payday loan place. So I went and made sure there wasn't nobody walking. And I went and thought I was clear. Then I saw Sister Robinson. Ah. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Sister Robinson. Praise the Lord, Pastor. <laughs> I wouldn't have passed it in, but. But yeah, I mean, and you, you stay away from them. Why? Because the interest rate on those, those loans are like, like 900%. Yeah. So stay away from them at all costs. Yeah. When you're investing, you're investing for the long game. I don't even watch the stuff no more. I've invested it, I bought it, I made a decision, I'm gonna stick to the decision. And when I go, it, it's always increasing. And then you'll look and you'll see red. That means you lost the day. Then you go back and it increases more. So here's the deal. I want you to fill out your risk assessment, but I also want to tell you this, because there's a balance to everything. Don't invest what you're afraid to lose. 
Write that down. I don't invest nothing that I'm scared to lose. Because if I'm afraid to lose it, that means I'm not ready to invest it. Are y'all understanding? Don't let nobody talk you into it. If you're doing the, the double dutch, trying to figure out if you should do it, just stop. Just stop, don't do it. Now there's a difference between moving by faith. But if you can't afford to lose it, and if you're afraid to lose it, then don't invest it.